play that, and we'll play the doubles tomorrow. So yeah, yeah that's fine. So the last SC is London Open to play tomorrow, is it? No, we've got one more round to play tomorrow. Okay. So, but I'm waiting for people to play. Yes. Yeah. So you're on, or on call oh, as well? Yeah, I'm on call. I'll come and sit here until someone tells me I need not to be here. Which, which they do. Yeah. Which they do. So uh, the boards are now being set up for the... Who are we getting? Is this Mosche and Stavafel? This is Mosche versus Stavafel. Okay. Uh, it's very exciting. Have you, have you had a chance to watch many of the other matches? Well, I just watch, I watched the end of Raj's match earlier and just generally watching whatever I pass by, really. Mm. So, uh, I, don't, I don't know what I you saw Carter about. against, is it Bill Riles, I think? Okay. Yeah, I don't know okay. who won, I don't even know who won. How, however, I don't know if you're friends with either of them on Facebook. I know Carter, yes. I'm on Facebook. Yeah, they, they have rather differing political opinions. <laughs> So uh, I don't I don't know how that match went if they uh, if they managed to stick to backgammon or get onto politics which might have been a might have been a well, bit. Carter plays with earphones in, so I'm guessing there was not much conversation. So he's all right. He's blocked yeah. it out. Absolutely. Have you ever played with earphones in? No, no I don't. I don't want the music. I want to, exactly. Know. I think yeah, that's no. probably more, dis more yeah. distracting, isn't it, than than talking awesome. to players? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm quite happy playing naturally, shall we say. <laughs> Um, so, so tell us one of your backgammon stories then. One of your oh, where, where, where do you start? <laughs> where do you start? You've got a whole encyclopedia, haven't you? Yeah. All, all the uh, incredible backgammon stories. Do you think we have the same level of excitement nowadays that there used to be? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think <coughs> nowadays actually you get the chance to see it. So many backgammon stories from the 60s and 70s are probably apocryphal um, in, because no one wrote anything down. Yeah. The first recorded well, the first person to record a match was 1973, so we're only, what, 41 years into recorded history of backgammon. Oh, so when you say record, you mean even just writing down? Writing down editions. moves. Yeah. So whatever happened in the 30s, no one knows, no one ever wrote anything down. Um, and as I say, so, so we've only got 40 years of history, really, although the game is 5,000 years old, whereas chess has been recorded for 400 years. Mm. Okay, so you may not think much of chess in the early days, but... We've, we've caught up very quickly and the computers have helped us catch up very quickly um, and it's a very different game and obviously you know you can reproduce everything on a screen here on a, on a computer at home I've got I'm writing a seminar for I've just finished writing a seminar for next week so I'm doing match play, match play seminar uh, here and then in Oslo in uh, three weeks time um, and it's just so much easier. You've got so much material to work from in, in the old days. You know, wh where are you going to get it? No one wrote anything down. So <laughs> it's quite interesting that I've been learning a lot about the history of the the Hippodrome Casino, mm. which has got an incredible history. It was actually built in 1900. Right. And if you think about the modern game of backgammon, starting from maybe about 1920, obviously quite a similar period. Mm. Um, and the Hippodrome started as a circus, that's obviously what Hippodrome means. Mm. So uh, the main casino floor, if you've had a chance to look down, I think I've got a shot there. The shot that when we saw, uh, looking at the players, you can see the casino behind them, uh, that was a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they had sea lion shows okay. and lion taming. And uh, also, which I didn't, I promised I would reveal this fact right at the start <laughs> of the day, but they also, they've got a balcony right at the top where they'd have tightrope walk. Have a look next time you're out mm -hmm. in the casino. So they had a, a, a balcony where tightrope walkers would walk across and also they would get dwarves to jump from that balcony into the pool <laughs> down on the ground floor. So uh, they, the, and the casino today, they actually em employ uh, right. dwarves to take people around the casino <laughs> and explain the history to them, which is quite nice. <laughs> they don't have to do any jumping though, which I think is probably politically incorrect. Yeah. yeah. But it's quite, they've, they've made a lot of effort to retain the history and obviously in the, the 20s and 30s, as backgammon was uh, taking off, mm. it was very big for burlesque shows, yeah. which obviously yeah. have kind of fallen out of fashion and come back into fashion again. Yeah. And it's, um, if you go in the history of backgammon, you're saying 1920s, so realistically when the Dublin Cube turned up is the, is the start of modern backgammon. Mm. So 1926, so again we're what, 80, just under 80 years, uh, just under 90 years into really, you know, modern play. Um, but no one wrote down the theory of doubling before 1970, so the, uh, the cube arrived in 1926 and you've got a 44-year gap before anybody actually sensibly wrote Worked down the theory of, of even the basic maths of, of doubling, which is actually, you know, what were people doing for 44 years? Well, did people write down any incorrect theories? Oh, yes. Okay. I mean, if you look at... So there was a, a whole sort of wave of books around about 1930 cashing in on the... Uh, the emergence of the game and its popularity, uh, which probably reached its height just before the Great Depression in, in 29. Um, 
and what you're reading there is, you know, without being overly insulting to our uh, ancestors, uh, just wrong. Yes. You know, and and yeah. so far wrong. Mm. You know. If you roll three good doubles at the start, you, you should probably double. You know, but I mean, you have to take count of what your opponent's doing as well. Mm. Um, so I, I guess people slowly made made their way towards it. Somewhere in the 60s, people began to think about the arithmetic mm. that goes with the game. And then Oswald and Jacoby wrote it down in, in 1970. Um, and even then, um, most backgammon theory in the 70s was based on experts telling you um, what the best move was, but you only had their uh, word for that. There was a little bit of empir empirical evidence from manual rollouts, but they were never statistically exactly, significant. Exactly, yes, you just didn't have yeah. enough time to do it. The, so, the way the from 1970 yeah. to 1993, there was a lot of guessing, and then the first computer turned up, TD Gammon, in 1993, and that really changed, started to change back then overnight, really, and then people then used computers to do analysis. Admittedly, they weren't that great at the start, but they were a lot better than even then most of the human beings who were trying to play. Yeah. Yes. So, really, we've had 20 years of very rapid evolution, yeah. Um, but you know the most difficult thing is is the uh, doubling cube, and in all of those twenty years, only four books have been written about a doubling cube, and two of those are actually inaccurate because right. they were written before the advent of computers. So you've got two books in in that uh, that are d dedicated to the doubling cube. <laughs> it would be quite interesting to talk to Falafel about this. Obviously, he'd yeah. have to go off to play the match. But I mean, are computers better than people now? Is that he was talking about the low standard of play? Um, <coughs> does he believe that computers are playing well? I mean, do you believe that computers are playing well? Yeah, so unfortunately I worked for IBM for a long time <laughs> and I've been in computers all my life, so yes, I do believe that they are very strong. Um, they might be a percent out now and then, um, but realistically they're finding now the best play most of the time. And most human players make a huge amount of errors. Um, we talked about doing 10,000 hours analysis, so as you do 10,000 hours, all you learn is the game is even more complicated <laughs> than you thought it was. Um, and that keeps going forever, doesn't it? it? Even after you've done 10,000 hours, yeah. it still just yeah. gets more and more complicated. And particularly the Dublin Cube, and here, you know, we're playing, um, you know, matches all weekend, and when you add match play theory to, to doubling theory, um, people tend to play matches quite often, like they play for money at home with their friends, relatives, or, or even in the club. And sometimes the plays are so different, and the Cube action is so different, and that most people don't adjust. Yeah. Um, you could have seen that really in that redouble mm. in, in the previous game. Yeah. And uh, you, you've got to think, you've got to stop and think. Moshi, who's about to play, one of his rules is the 12 second rule. So basically, you never ever make a huge decision in less than 12 seconds, be okay. it taking or doubling. Um, because you have to look at the position, you then have to take into account the score critically here. Um, and you also have to take account of the opponent factor as well. So, you know, I've played a couple of people here who've obviously turned up, had a bit of fun, but you know, haven't been that good, uh, in all honesty. They're starting out in their backgammon career. And you then have to adjust your cube strategy just a little bit, you know, to take account of what they may or may not do. Um, the other thing we've been seeing, actually, in the tournament today is people adjusting their cube strategy based on time. So there was a double earlier that Moshi dropped because his opponent was short on time, mm -hmm. so that obviously he's then forcing his opponent to make lots of moves very, very quickly, and mm -hmm. hence probably induce an error, yeah. when if there were no time constraints, obviously it would have been a take. Yeah, and time, you know, people are now used, I think, to playing with clocks, but Raj only had 12 seconds left on his clock when he finished his match, uh, and there's certainly an instance, I think it was Sander Lyloff played the last seven points of a match with three seconds left. So you, know, you do have to use your time. Uh, and you also, you don't have infinite time. So years ago I played in the British Championships in Spain because at the time that's where they were playing. <laughs> uh, and I was waiting for a match to finish to play a final of something. And, and the guy actually made me miss my plane. Because was, was his surname was Brown, I can't remember his first name, but he was the slowest player ever. Um, and, you know, it's taking 10 minutes a move sometimes. Uh, nowadays, you can take 10 minutes, but, you know, that's half your bank gone. Exactly. So you only do, you know, do that twice, yeah. and then you can't do it anymore. So most of the time, or, you know, say 70% of the time, you pretty much know what the right move is, and you should make it probably within the 12-second allowance. People like Falafel, people like Moshi, think at the time that it is appropriate to think when there's a really difficult decision to make. Yeah. 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 And having said that, 
I had a really difficult decision to make in my match, and I thought for three and a half minutes, and I still got it wrong, right? So, you know, because uh, you ask Falafel whether it's easier to play or analyse, um, I actually play better analysing, probably, than I, than I play overboard sometimes. Well, do you think it's fair, then, for players to ask not to play with a clock? Because I was actually talking earlier about French players, and I think, you know, one of the greatest French players of all time, Francois Tardieu, he doesn't play much backgammon now because he won't play with a clock, and all tournaments are using clocks. I think you have to go over the time. I mean, you know, it's it's nice to have all the time in the world, but actually, tournament directors have a tournament to run. They want to go home tomorrow. People um, have lives to yeah, go back yeah. to. Oh no, some people don't have lives. Flaffle doesn't have a life. He blows back down. <laughs> but you know that that's fine. That's what he wants to do. And Moshi, you know, uh, devotes even even more time probably to study as well. Though he's now the father of a young child, so I'm sure that has an influence. Uh, we will see. <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, talking about the rules and the way the rules are changing. Um, Moshi will notice, and we'll notice this when they start playing, the, the board's getting set up, we can see. Um, but um, Moshi's playing uh, touch move, so he's playing the same rule that you'd play in chess, that when you touch a piece you have to move it. Obviously that's not actually the rule in this mm. tournament, but he must be used to playing that. Um, we got a comment on the live stream said that this is now the rules of Japan okay. in Japanese tournaments. Um, do you think that's a good rule for Batman? I quite like that rule. Um, I think sometimes, particularly when you get small doubles, people shuffle the checkers around and then sometimes they have to ask the spectators, I had an instance today, you know, where was this checker? Okay, so I was able to help, but I think um, it would speed the game up, it would make people think, um, and I think it's a generosity that people are allowed to shuffle checkers and look at the end result of plays, and it would add another level of um, complexity to the game, which obviously we desperately need. But no, I think it's a really good idea. Would it? I mean, would it discourage beginners, though, maybe, from playing? I think, yeah, horses for courses. To a certain extent, you could not have it in beginners tournaments. Mm. I think um, because when you learn, it's very, very difficult, and you need to begin to learn the patterns that the game produces. So, you know, for an open tournament, fine. For an intermediate, maybe you you keep the other rule. And there's no there's no reason not to have. You don't have. It's like football, you know. The reason you don't have a load of technology in football is is that everyone wants it to be the same as grassroots. But I personally believe is that's absolute rubbish. Um, you've got the technology, and you should use it. Um, Let me just ask you a question, mm. in case you know. No, no, uh, no worries if you don't know. But I know you've got a lot of history. Mm. But um, the touch move in chess, the rule. Do you know where it came from? How it originated? I don't. Because obviously, I thought you were a chess player. Yeah, I was a chess player your before your I was a backgammon player, but. Um, Obviously, it's been around all my chess life, and the uh, famous French phrase "jadoub," so I adjust, so mm. you can touch a piece without actually playing it. Yeah, it's been around all my life as well to, 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 to tidy it up. Yeah. yeah. Um. So we've still got no matches going. We've got another match, and um, because we can now see the names, then um, Eric. It, yeah. it looks like Eric's going to be playing Mishi. That will probably be in the professionals tournament, I would have thought. And we've also just had delivered to us uh, the uh, the current result. So this is this is the London Open, and uh, obviously we were talking there that you're through and waiting for an for opponent, so yep. we can see that still. And my opponent is still not there, so uh, I shall be here for a while. Um, Bill Riles is still in of the uh, USBGF. Uh, and so we got lots, lots of um, UK players. Araf Alipour, who we saw um, playing against Moshi earlier, right yeah. at the start in the professionals, he's still in in the London Open. All right, I have my host from Norway, so in two weeks' time I'm off to Oslo to give two seminars, once, one on match play and one on advanced doubling, so Hal Skara is uh, making his first trip to a foreign tournament, so well done to him for getting through. And we've got a few of the um, Italian players still in, Andrea De Zandonati, mm -hmm. they've been doing a good, a good showing at these yep. tournaments, um, with Fabio Galotto obviously he's, winning he's the professionals twice. Yeah, we'll he's out though this year. Is he? he? Is mm -hmm. he? You've already, you've already checked that out. And unfortunately his Rome tournament clashes with the um, UK Open, which is a great shame because apparently... You, did you go last year? Did you go to Rome? Um, yes, we did, we did go to the Rome tournament. Yeah. It was lovely, really, really lovely yeah, no, tournament. Yeah, I need to do that one, yeah. Okay, so apparently Mishy is going to be playing Sean Casey in the London Open. And I play so the winner. That's, that's currently playing. Yeah. He's currently playing okay, um, just Sean Casey. Um, and then he'll be playing against Mer Eric McAlpine in the professionals tournament. So that's just what I was mentioning. Who will? Mishy? Mishy will be. Who? So the um. board set up, and we've got a luxury that people at home don't have, that we can see these boards set up. And um, they've got the names out on the uh, against the boards. 
And so there's an Eric McAlpine Michi board there waiting to go. Uh, rather nice board, I suspect that's someone's personal that is board. That's Eric's personal board. Is it? There it we is. Go. Yes. That's good level of knowledge. You're Indeed. a very good trivia man. Or we're not players. yet. We've got we've got an online tournament system which we've tweeted the uh, the link a couple of times, but uh, we're still having to do it by paper, unfortunately. We haven't mm. quite got it all linked up. So it's it's come on leaps and bounds though since uh, over the, what three years that it's, well, uh, I guess on the note is technically older than that, is it? Well, um, so let's see, we're 2014, mm. last year 2013, uh, winner of the London Open last year, I'm sorry, 2012 winner Marcus Rinch, mm, yeah. uh, the year before, the winner, I can't remember his name, he was uh, one of the Nordic players, uh, but he beat Julian Fetterlein in yeah, the final, and Julian right. Fetterlein seems to often get to finals, but not, yep. make, it, not, <laughs> not make the last hurdle. Right. Right. One of the strongest English players that there is. I, I'll, if you had to, if you had to give an answer, who would you say is stronger out, Julian and Raj? I'd probably get them to play an eleven-point match. It's very close. But I have a feeling that Raj might just just have it, but I'm, you know, mm. I'm, I'm not giving any money away on that one. I mean, for many years, Julian was considered to be the mm. top player, and he then that showed in the rankings as mm. well that he was a high, a high, more highly placed in the Giants' ranking than Raj. But Raj has since, in recent yeah, years, I think. Uh, the Giants is a nice little thing, but it's um, it's not a true measure. What backgammon properly needs is a real rating system, you know, proper ELO system. And again, similar to the chess system, where every yeah. match you play, it's recorded, mm -hmm. it's yeah. put into the system. Yeah. So um, one way of trying to get an understanding is at least to play on something like grid gammon, where you consistently, where most or a lot of the world's top players play uh, online. Um, there's no money involved. It's just purely for ranking points and the fun of playing. Uh, and you can, you know, slowly improve your your rating if you're good enough to do that. So you know, you start at fifteen hundred and up up you go. And I think Paul Weaver, U.S. master, who's commentated on the London Open before mm -hmm. now, is currently the number one ranked player on that. But oh, how people like Mishi and Moshi are sort of up there as well. And so the, the, these are players who are playing. They're playing a substantial number of games. Yeah, on this, are they? it also tells you it, you have a number which reflects how many games you played your experience so um, it takes a long time to get up from 1500 I started a couple months ago I'm just approaching 1700 now and I'd hope somewhere to get over 1900 in, in due course but that will be probably you know something like a year away because um, mm. I, I play r randomly sometimes I play a lot sometimes I don't play at all um, but people like Paul are, are on there most days uh, and they probably won't accept a challenge from a very low rank player uh, initially, so you've got to get up before you can start playing the, the, the big ones, and there's tournaments on there as well. Is that because of essentially the, the way the ranking system works that you've got more to lose playing against? The yeah, you, you drop more if you lose to a low, much lower rank. Player. And I suppose, particularly if you've got players like yourself who are coming up through the ranks who mm. maybe aren't yet at the level they will mm. eventually reach, then you, you're expecting to lose the LO points against them. Yes, you would do. Um, but, um, it, it, there's a huge range of backgammon talent on there, shall we say? Yeah. Yes. But um, it's it's a great way. I mean, eventually, the Americans will sort out their internet gaming laws, hopefully. Mm. Um, well, I was going to ask about that when you mm. said it was an online site. You mm. obviously went on to say it wasn't for money. No. But a lot of the online sites are closing down, aren't they? Because they haven't got the players. Because they're losing the American market, they don't have enough players to, to keep it going. Yes, I mean, the online <coughs> market started with a bang. The Americans were there. Um, Party Yaman was sort of a, a very heavily uh, subscribed site, and there was the Bahamas Open with a million dollars prize money, which I think they lost a lot of money on. Um, and what happened is that a lot of Middle East people piled in and played online, but they weren't used to the, using the Dublin Cube. So for two or three years, the Western world cleaned up, making a huge amount of money. But then you got left only with the players who could actually play. And that wasn't enough, it wasn't sustainable as a business model. Yeah, um, uh, we're just going to have to take a quick break. We haven't got any matches yet, so we're just going to take a break for, for a couple of minutes and then we're back, back on.
Slim down. Thanks for, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, you're back here at the London Open. I'm here with Chris Bray. We've just had another update that uh, we're waiting on the big, big match in the Super Jackpot, which is a £1,000 entry. A uh, 16-player tournament started late on Friday. Players were playing uh, late into the night last night. Um, in the semi-finals, we're down to just four players now, uh, and one of the matches will be um, Moshi, the world number one, against Falafel, the world number three, who we've just been hearing from a lot in the commentary box. Now, it's my understanding that um, Moshi is uh, not able to play until he has some dinner. It is difficult sometimes for players to fit food in. Do you manage to eat today, Chris? I did. I had the standard tournament burger. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Keeps you going. But you, you can play back young for hours and forget to eat. And it actually, like everything else, <laughs> it's very important that you do eat because you just run out of energy. Um, and in fact, to be... Uh, a good and top back and play, I believe you also need to be pretty physically fit because mm. it's okay if you play all right for seven hours and then you fall asleep in the eighth hour and make silly moves. Yeah, so. And it's actually something we've noticed earlier with Mot Motri, we looked at one of his matches this morning, mm. he seemed to have a lot of techniques for making sure he was playing his best game. Mm. So not just about um, studying and learning the right moves to play, but obviously there's that extra element of playing the moves that you spent the time learning how to play and actually playing your best game. Yeah, it's, um, there's a lot to do when you're playing backgammon. It's very surprising because you're not only looking at the dice and making moves, but you have to decide what your plan is. Before you play any game in a tournament match, you should always consider the score and consider the strategy you're going to try to undertake at that particular score, and that's really important towards the end of the match. Um, but as the game progresses and the, the plan changes, obviously it's driven by the dice. And sometimes people actually don't make the change. So okay. maybe maybe they're running a blitz, the opponent anchors, and they, they're still in blitz mode, and they make moves accordingly, which are sometimes pretty disastrous. So you have to consistently think about what's going on, and when your opponent's rolling and thinking, you should still be using that time as well, because we discussed earlier that you know, clocks are now in play, so you might as well use all of the elapsed time rather than just the time when you are on roll. There's just so many things going on, aren't there? Yeah. And if you allow yourself to get worn down, one of the other things we mentioned, obviously, is the great achievement of Raj last year being in both the finals of mm. the London Open and the professionals tournaments. But even just being in the final of one tournament, um, the top players, or not, not but the top, very top players maybe, but a lot of very good players mm. play a very good game of backgammon. But after several days mm -hmm. of playing through a tournament, when you get to the final, you end up playing worse. Yeah, uh, and Raj obviously been playing in two tournaments and got through to both finals. Yeah, so it's a, a remarkable achievement. He's slightly younger than I am. But, uh, um, it, it, the market is there really for someone slightly younger to come. I mean, a lot of players, back young players, are of my generation or you know, maybe the generation below. There's a lot of people my age, and uh, it would be nice to see some younger people coming through. They still need the ten thousand hours as a balance here. Mm. Um, but if you go back to two thousand three and Jan Jan Royce was world champion in 2003 and he hardly played a human being during 2003 because he lives north of the Arctic Circle uh, and he spent uh, obviously there's not a lot of light there's not a lot to do so um, he spent the best part of eight months literally playing backgammon so he got from being an average player to being a very strong mm. player literally by doing nothing else for for eight months so whereas probably when I was young growing up and you know the theory was inaccurate and there weren't as many games available it probably took you ten years, realistically, to become a, a strong tournament player. Now you can you can do that in two if you if that's what you want to do. Yeah, um, if you want to spend all of your time yeah. playing backgammon and not doing anything else. But it's like anything else, you know. If you want to be a top tennis player, top footballer, you know, you spend hours. You know, David Beckham didn't get to be a great footballer just because it's genetic. And he spent hours and hours and hours practicing. Ronaldo, is a fanatical practicer. Um, you know, the Williams sisters probably spent more hours on court than any other tennis player in the world. It doesn't happen by chance. And, yeah. you know, we've heard from Falafel already that basically he spends hours studying. Um, well, I for Falafel, it wasn't even just studying, but when he started, he spent hours watching first yeah. to, to know to get into the game, mm -hmm. and then playing as well. It's, it's kind of everything. Yeah. Um, certainly when I was young and learning, you know, the best way to learn was to watch stronger players, and particularly play in a chouette, which didn't cost you too much money. Um, and I spent, uh, in 1982, I spent six months living in New York, so I didn't make any money, but I learned a, a lot just by because I was playing with some of the best people in the world, mm -hmm. and hopefully, you know, it was relatively low stakes, so I paid for my education. I bet you had a lot of fun as well. I did have a lot of fun. Yes, I managed to play 27 hours without a break once. 
Now that must, or your play must have deteriorated by the end of that. It's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> You're going back in so long, you have no I won, idea. I think I lost, I either won or lost $15. I had something like 14 cups of coffee and six apples. And it all kind and of... And it didn't move from, yeah. from the table. No. And one of the things I was thinking is you're talking about the balance of younger players who maybe you're suggesting might be a bit physically more fit mm. and able to put in a better performance and players who've done 10,000 hours. One of the things you see, particularly with sports like football and tennis, that are so highly competitive and a lot of parents, you know, they're coaching their children to go into it. We're not really seeing that with backgammon, that if children play, they play other games, they're not really learning. No, uh, and unfortunately it's not part of the school curriculum, whereas chess could well become part of the uh, UK school curriculum at a point in time. It, it probably has a bad history because it's viewed as a, a gambling game um, and maybe historically that's true but actually it's it's a game that requires <coughs> quite a lot of life skills to, to do and uh, you know I, I try to teach children when I didn't get the opportunity to do that but it's uh, you need dedicated people to, to run clubs to do this stuff mm. unfortunately. Um, or, you know, and you and I have talked before, you put it on the map through media, one way or the other, uh, be that a pro-am tournament or, you know, something like this helps, great, uh, but you just need more of it, you need good online material. Um, and if we get the, the sort of um, holy grail, it's probably still getting a, you know, decent television series out of it. Um, it's happened a couple of times, um, but unfortunately, you've got to have sponsors and all the rest of it. You know, we live in a modern world where if you haven't got sponsorship, it doesn't happen. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and so much of Backgammon is, is run by really amazing volunteers mm. who are running all of these international, these big international tournaments mm. pretty much on a, on a voluntary mm. basis or just for expenses. And that's an incredible investment by those people when there is no professional funding available for the game. Yeah, and Backgammon flourishes where there are people who really love the game and take an interest. You know, mm. Carol Joy Cole in Flint in Michigan, which you would not, you know, earmark as a centre. Bill Davis in, in Chicago, you know, um, Michael Crane has run Bieber for years. Um, we've now got a UK Backgammon Federation, let's hope that helps a little bit as well. So every, every little bit helps, um, but you've got to have the people who are prepared to put the, the hours in. Mm. Yeah. And obviously one of those people is, is Moshi, who's been building up the, uh, the Japanese... Um, I think it's Japanese Federation. Some some mm. of these organisations have slightly different names, yeah. but the, the Japanese organisation for backgammon, um, and also going into schools. Because I think one of the things is to take um, take these games into schools. I know there's a great organisation um, called Chess in Schools and Communities, mm -hmm. taking the game of chess to children so they're learning from a young age and learning not just the game, but the skills that you need for the game. Are lots of skills that are cross applicable, mm. but backgammon has even more skills that are perhaps even more useful dealing with probability, dealing with uncertainty and risk that, that young people can't learn from chess, but uh, they, they can from backgammon. Brilliant, we've got another commentator joining us, so um, we'll have to work out how to do a bit of a reshuffle. There's no, there's no matches either at the moment. No. So perhaps if, if I pop over here and you pop in Chris and we'll pop yeah. Julian in on the end. <coughs> Come in, he's, he's thinking about it. Come in, Julie. Right. Come in and have a Greetings. seat. Greetings. Hello, Good how afternoon. are you doing? How are you doing? We, uh, we've had, been having a little chat about Chris. you. Afternoon, Julie. The, the you versus Raj. Yeah. That oh. old conundrum. Yes, absolutely. Yes. 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 <laughs> who's, the better, who's the better player? What would you say? Uh, well, I think I'm quite clear with my view on this. That <laughs> I'm, I'm the better player, but he always wins against me. Right. <laughs> and have you been uh, watching any of the backgammon today? Yes, I uh, I saw some of the match that uh, Falafel and Marcus were commenting on, which was uh, Sean against Raj. Yes. And uh, it was a good match, very exciting, and good commentary, I think. I mean, were you surprised? We, uh, we were having a little chat to them after the, the match, and they were saying how surprised they were at some of the mistakes that were being made um, in that match. Were you, were you surprised, too, to see that? Yes, that, um, you know... That, I know all these people and you have some idea as to the level they play at and I think both of them could have played much better than they did in that particular match mm. but we all have good matches and bad matches. When you ask people sort of how they play mm. they'll say oh well I play three because they've played half a dozen mm. matches at three but yeah. they won't bother to mention that there were another three seven. matches they played at seven or ten or something. Right. 
So have you explained performance ratings? Uh, no. It's <laughs> so Julian's talking about performance ratings, so computers give you performance ratings uh, based on the number of errors and blunders that you make during a match. Uh, if you can play at four or below, you're rated as world class. Um, and in fact in Japan, Moshi or Mishi, I can't remember which, has now has a sub four club. Uh, Moshi has indeed set up the sub yeah. four club. Not many members yet. No, and it? you have to play at least ten full length matches with an average of under four and that, as Julian said, is a very difficult thing to do. Well the other the other thing in the small print is you have to specify beforehand that the matches count <laughs> towards this. So you can't pick your best ten. Right. You have to say, OK, I'm recording all my matches mm. from this tournament, so if mm. I play some bad ones, they count towards your rating as well. Yeah. So do you both think you could do it? What would what, what happen if you took on this challenge? I can play... I mean, I analyse all my games on games grid after I play them. I can play circa four most of the time. As Julian says, you have the odd seven. My average over the last, I think, 20 matches is around about four. The difference between me and... Moshi and, and Falafel is they can probably hit about 2.5 and sometimes 1.5 and that makes a difference in, yeah. in winning a tournament. So obviously if you're average four you're not yeah. coming in consistently. No. How about you Julian? Um, well I don't actually have XG I have to make a confession but uh, I played in a the last numbers I've got was I played in a European backgammon internet federation it was five 13 point matches and I played average 3.8 on those. Yeah. Okay. So it just shows how, dif how yeah, difficult it is. It, it is, is really difficult. So if you play at 3.84, you're going to win some tournaments. You're going to have time. If you play money games, you're probably going to come out ahead. To consistently be in the top 5 to 10 in the world, you're probably going to have to average around about 2.5 mm -hmm. or less. And, and people like Moshi and, and Flaffle and also Nat Ballard and, and Paul Weaver and people like that have that capability, I think. Uh, and yeah, that there's, separates them. There's, there's one other complication, is that when there's a significant skill difference in players then I believe your doubling strategy should change considerably. Whereas XG basically treats all players as equal. Mm. So it, its view is based on two equal players. And one thing I've noticed of the, the very best players is that although their cube decisions might vary slightly, that they still come up with very low averages. Mm. And they will say sort of, yes, against a stronger player, maybe I'd have doubled this or you know, I was marginal on it, but they they still come up with very low numbers even when they change their doubling mm. strategy slightly and the computer still says so. But basically they don't make any big blunders. If there's something that says the computer says it's a must double, they will always double it. Yeah, and I think Nack Ballard said one of the most useful things ever for aspiring match players. And, and he said basically he will often redouble positions that you know aren't even a redouble because a lot of people drop when the cube gets to four and above and he said about this the, the bots are clueless um, and he's won an awful lot of matches by very aggressive redoubling. Mm. Um, it is interesting though this idea that the top players tend to um, even though they're varying their strategy, they're varying it within a set of parameters, it mm. would appear. Whereas I think perhaps less skilled players may try, and maybe the people in the middle tier playing against people in the bottom tier, they're trying to moderate their behaviour to take advantage of the weaker players, but end up actually kind of, uh, you know, shooting themselves in the foot. Yes. Because they, they, they the, make a play. The worst so thing bad. you could do is misassess the player's strengths. <laughs> and it's. It's an old axiom in backgammon that in every backgammon match, both of the players are 90 favourite to win. But you ask any player, they will say, "Yes, I'm favourite against this guy." You know that you know he might win tournaments, but against him, I always win. And now I think maybe that's it's a bit, a bit of an exaggeration. But people generally tend to think that they're stronger than they really are, mm. and their opponents are weaker than they are. And the worst mistakes they make are based on this misassessment of player strengths. Mm. The other thing we've just been talking about is uh, 10,000 hours theory and how, uh, how a backgammon genius is born. How many hours do you think you've put into the game? Oh, heavens, I've, I've no idea. <laughs> I've lost count. <laughs> yeah, I think it's... At the moment, I primarily play online. That's why I haven't, people haven't seen me so much at tournaments. But I'm playing about 10 hours a day, seven days a week, mm. so... I'm getting through something like 5,000 short matches in a year. Mm. Are you playing Uh Online, I'll mm. say that, at oh. several sites. Mm. And the most I've done is 36 matches in a day. 
Well, that's for some small. reason, it's always on Fridays. It's very busy. I think it's because it's a it's a Muslim day of rest. So they go to the mosque and then they go out and play backgammon. Anyway, I think we're, we're about, about to ready start. to kick off. Okay. So this is the professionals tournament round three, with. Eric McAlpine against Mishy. Mishy. That's right, because we were just waiting for um, Mishy in the London Open was playing Sean Casey, the Irish player, uh, who we obviously were, were looking at playing against Raj earlier. Um, and so we've been waiting for Mishy to be um, not well, not knocked out necessarily, <laughs> but to finish that match, either to win it or to uh, to lose it, so that he can come and play this match against Eric McAlpine. Obviously, Eric is a is a British player. Have you both played against him? Yeah, so Eric plays regularly in the Battersea Chouette where I play, and uh, he's a relative newcomer to the game, but he plays a lot. He's actually a squash professional. Um, uh, uh, I don't know how. No, he he's, he's oh, still teaches squash. squash. Okay. I don't think he plays very much nowadays because he had an injury, but he can still teach quite well. Um, so that's his day job, uh, which leaves him quite a lot of time to play back home. Yes, I mean, I, I played Eric once in the Gibraltar International and it got down to double match point, the very last game, so it was sort of 10-10 to 11 and I, I managed to snatch victory. Uh, but uh, he's coming off a very good result in the, the Nordic Open. That uh, He did very well in the main tournament there, I think he made the quarter-finals and then won a few matches in the, the fighters bracket after that. And uh, last week I saw one of his matches online. He is, uh, it would be match in the last quarter final against uh, Sven Olaf Norman. And I was very impressed by Eric's play. But, uh, I think he's a very solid player, has a very firm understanding of the game. And uh, I think he, we're going to look going to have a good match with him and Mitchie. Well, one of the things that's been pointed out is that Eric Eric's play has been improving so quickly. So it's not it's not simply that he's suddenly turned up as a good backgammon player. Actually, mm. if you go perhaps even just a few years back, yeah. his play was not nearly as good. And uh, that's perhaps something that comes from that professional sports background. He's obviously got the yeah. persistence. Of no, I mean, I first met Eric uh, about two or three years ago at this tournament at the London Open at a different venue. And you know, he was playing the warm-up event and he made some mistake in the bear-off, a simple mistake, and I talked to him about that. And uh, since then, uh, I've seen him a few times, and every time I see him, he's keen to learn more, but he's always knowing more to start with. Mm. Mm, great. So we, we avid can... photographer of positions, is Eric? Yeah, and well, yes. of course, that's how you analyse him. Mm. One other thing is, um, Eric, uh, he's got a, a family background from Jamaica. So it looks like he's got his board here with us, which is uh, based on the Jamaican flag. Okay. May, it, may it bring him luck. And how about Mishi? Obviously, we see more of Mishi um, in online matches, and obviously he is the uh, recently voted number two giant of the world. So he's obviously a phenomenal player. Have either of you played him? I've played him three times now. Two short matches, one long match, and I've scored zero out of three. <laughs> But the uh, first time I played him in Las Vegas, I was sort of 85, 90% favourite to win and got hit in the bear off. Then I played him in the last chance in the quarterfinals in Vegas, and he gave me a 4 0 start to 5 and still won. And then I played him for a third time this morning in <laughs> a five point match. and. Uh, Roland actually recorded the match, and five-point matches, it's it's not so difficult to get a low rating. It's not the same as long matches where cube strategy so basically changes. you've got less chance to make an error. Yeah, and if you find there's a cube in the first game, then basically the cube is dead after that, and what this is what happened. Mitchie cubed me the first game, won a gammon, so he's 4-0 up Crawford, and then there's no cube errors at all from there on in. <laughs> And the numbers with this was Mitchy played 2.86 and I played 2.36. So I don't feel upset so too got much the moral about victory. Uh, yeah, you're I don't feel too upset about losing, and I'm sure he's not upset about winning either. Yeah. <laughs> and it's quite interesting that, similar to uh, this question that I love to pose of mm -hmm. whether you or Raj is really the better player, there is a similar question about Moshi and Mishi, obviously, are the number mm -hmm. one and two in Japan. And Moshi has a higher profile, he won the world championship. Um, and that does play into the backgammon giants because it's a voting system. Is mm. it possible that Michi is in fact a better player than Moshi? Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't seen so much of Michi's games. I know everyone talks very highly of him and he gets very good results. But 
One other thing Mochi has got is someone said to me today, he has a, a very high internet presence. So he's got his own blog where he posts his, his positions and questions about backgammon. And he always publishes his matches, he records lots of his matches, and he puts them all online so mm. people can judge them. It's not like he says, well, okay, I'll pick my best two matches from the tournament. If he plays a tournament, he'll record ten matches and you'll get to see ten matches. Yeah, and in fact, he delights in talking about his errors. And I think that's one of the things you could... In any kind of learning theory, actually, mm. which we've been talking about, it's the people who delight in learning from their failures and have the kind of emotional strength to cope with them and be able to talk about them and not feel the need to hide them away and pretend yeah. they're better than they are. That they're better than they are. That's obviously been key to his learning to so, get to where he is. I mean, my suspicion is that Mochi is slightly better, but I, I don't think, fair, speaking honestly, I don't think I have enough evidence to back this up. Yes. <laughs> but I can't prove it. It's just a suspicion at the moment. My, my personal record is that. I've played Mochi three times and I've won all of those. <laughs> <laughs> so that's obviously why I think he's the best player. Brilliant. So we're still waiting. Yeah. We can see People some People chuggling around. Going on. Yeah. Obviously a problem with the setup. No doubt we will be underway shortly. So what's the, the schedule? We're going to start with, with Eric, Eric and, and Mochi. 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 But there's this other match with Mochi and Falafel, which is meant to start relatively soon as, as soon well. As soon as Mochi's eaten. Uh -huh. with the, the Mochi Falafel match, because that's the Super Jackpot match. Yeah. So that's scheduled to take place, because it's not part of the tournament that's yep. running today. It was scheduled to take place at five o'clock, but Mochi has asked to have a break so that he can have some dinner, mm -hmm. which we were uh, discussing is such a, a great skill. You know, it's kind of a meta skill. It's not really a backgammon skill to be able to know when to <laughs> eat, but it does help you play your best if you make sure you, you don't get tired or, uh, or hungry or thirsty and, and you are then focusing on the game. Yes, I mean when you do well in backgammon tournaments it's very much an endurance event as well and last year I managed to win, I think I won nine matches in a row in this thing and you know you're, you're effectively playing non-stop, you're playing a match having a 10-15 minute break and going back and playing another one and it goes on and on and on mm. but I mean that's good because you like that's playing backgammon and <laughs> It's much better to be doing that than it is to have lost and be down in the commentary booth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's unfortunate, isn't it? So what we can see actually is that Roland Herrera there is setting up with a computer, so it looks like this match is going to be, be recorded. recorded. So um, we'll be able to afterwards have a look at uh, how the players did play, where their mistakes were. Yes, both both Roland and his wife Simonetta are good friends with Mitchy and. Uh, on his way over here, Mitchy stopped off at Bristol and gave a seminar in Bristol on, on Monday night to anyone who wanted to attend. So uh, he's doing his bit for the game as well. It's so, I mean, I mean, we were talking as well about Moshi and how much time he gives and how you know, generous he is with his time and his expertise, uh, both to experienced players and to, uh, going into schools in Japan. Maybe, maybe we'll need a bit of that in this country. We, need to, we just need to, maybe the UK BDF can uh, help us sort some of that out. Yes, I know in America, um, Phil Simborg has done some work on mm. this front and they, uh, they had a go at creating a tournament for uh, what they call college people, which is university students, and have a, a team competition with uh, different universities or colleges, as they call them there. And, uh, you know, so now they have a, a young college junior champion. Which is great, isn't it? You just need mm. to be getting players in at the bottom, yeah. don't you, if you want more players. In particular, <clears throat> if you're talking about people doing their 10,000 hours earlier, they've got, to, they've got to start younger. It's that simple. And as I say, Phil Simborg has had some success introducing it to schools, that there's a few great mathematicians who uh, are keen backgammon players. And there is certainly quite a bit of maths in backgammon, and it's, it's very helpful in terms of giving people a basic mathematical understanding of probability and statistics and it helps you win backgammon and rather than just sort of having to learn these rules in sort of maths textbooks you can actually learn something and apply it mm. and it's more pleasurable yes absolutely absolutely so uh, probably probably hanging on for a little bit until this, so uh, what i was asking earlier is are we going to to cut to the the falafel match when that starts or are we going to stay be staying with eric while he, he goes on yeah that's a great question what we're trying to do where possible because this is what uh, is easier for people watching is to stick with a match yep. when we start it. So uh, at the moment we're not entirely sure which of these matches is going to start first. 
Um, and also different players have been using different strategies in terms of number of breaks and how many breaks. Uh -huh. So I think certainly we'll make sure we take advantage of when there is a break, we'll cut over to the other match and mm. just take a look, because obviously there are two such great matches going on at the same time. Um, I mean, it would be so amazing to see the Moshi Falafel match, so it's just, it's just mm. a question of when they start. Um, and it, that is that Mishi we can see in the yeah, so jumper there. Yeah. <coughs> so he's ready, he's ready to go. There's obviously a computer problem with the recording, because Mishi's now providing technical support. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we're getting we're getting our update that they're about to start. We've had those updates before. Though. They're not always they're not always correct, but uh, often uh, uh, we can see. Yeah, you Michi can you can see in fact that Michi, yeah, Michi's going to sit down. And you and next to him, that's just who we were saying earlier. That's Robert yes. Herrera recording on the computer. Yeah, yeah, Michi has sat down, and it Eric? looks as though he has a, a cup of it looks like a cup of coffee to me. I would have thought he was a tea drinker, but. Uh, Anyway, the players are there, they're about to kick off, and this is round three of the professionals to 11 points. That's a 6 5, is it? I believe. 6 5. Lovers leap, and away we go. Former. Swiftly played as well. So it was a bit of a surprise to me that Mitchie actually slotted with yes. the 4 1. That, uh, it's, um, they played it very quickly, and I suspect. So, so hours of study. I certainly slot with 2 1 after an opening yes. 6 5. <coughs> going to run away. He's not going to run away. So it's, it's 5 3, and he's choosing to make the 3 point. I would run away. Yes, I, I don't like this move. I no. either run or bring yeah. two checkers down, but this this would be my so third choice. 6-3, so I suspect he will make the five point with the three. Yeah, and then there's, there's, there's not many sixes around. No or. easy six, no, but I think I think you're right. I think the play is to make the five point and then decide which six you yeah. you you could live with. But, he, uh, he could make two point technically, but yeah. I suspect he's not going to do that. Okay, so he's put the checkers where he wants them, to use McGreal's theorem. That looks like double six. So he hits, that's yeah, important, and three come, down. comes down with two, and he doesn't want to slot the two points over. So, uh, you know, the third checker down. We're just having a reorganisation here for a minute. <coughs> Is that five two? So that's a, that's a tough play. Yeah. So, choices are to come in the 23 point, remake the 8 point. Yes, you'd like, you'd like to remake the 8 point, but that leaves, leaves some good 6s. So he's now coming and duplicating the one that Eric needs to hit. So again, he's putting his checkers where they do good work. Well, it's 6 5, five I think. So now he can. So make the 5 the two. is going to go away. Well, he can make the 2 point, or uh, he can try and make this I think a single safe shot. <coughs> So we've got an interesting game here where Eric has got a, a vast yeah. race lead, but Mitchy has a, a strong positional advantage. Yeah. Oh, one, two. Absolute top number. Right. Hitting, so. making the board. And yeah. if Eric fans, we're going to probably see some cube action. But he's come in, but the five, he's come in with one five, and the five is very awkward has to hit, he can't play 13-8, so he has to hit something, so he can hit on the one point which is the safest play, or he can sit and hit on the two point which is slightly better positionally, but more shots, and I think with... With so many of them, yeah. Yeah, the, the big factor here is that White has a much stronger board, so Black needs to play as safely as possible, which he, he's looking at. So the extra numbers are four one five one. 
Uh, on top of one. So yeah. so an extra this is 16 five, numbers as opposed to 11. 11. So given the state of the other board, this looks like the right play. No. Yeah, I was fairly confident that Eric was going to find that, as I say. I think he's, he's, yeah. he's a much better player now than he used to be. And uh, when he's faced with these difficult decisions, nine times out of ten, he gets them right. So, we're now looking at Michi considering a double. Certainly if he rolls a one from the bar, there's going to be a lot of market losing sequences. Uh, the question is what happens when he doesn't roll a one? And yes. Is that strong enough then? So you give him an average roll, but like about 5-3, and in fact he's going to roll... Is that 5-6? I think it must be. Sorry, it's very hard to see the dice precisely. I think that is a 5-6. The time he's taking it might be a 4-6. So if it is 5-6, he's going to anchor with a 5, right, and then he's behind in the race so he wants to keep as much contact as possible, so again putting his checker where he wants it, which is on the bar, Eric needs a 6, it looks like he's rolled double 5. So with this and he's, two. again it's an awkward Make roll, the ace point. strengthening his board and hitting, and the game is going much as we'd expected, that uh, Eric still has a vast racing lead and Mitchy has a big positional superiority. So if Mitchy could get in, he's virtually won the game. But yeah. he's, he's in danger that if he stays but, out, yeah. then Eric can probably just run the whole thing home very quickly. I'm not sure about that last five. I know it gave six numbers to drop it down. And this looks like a return double five. Well, any five is a very good start. And I think what he'll want to do here is find some play where he can leave the bar point slotted and have lots yep. of covers for it. Uh, it's maybe bar in and then round to the ten point and then maybe eight, eight to three. Okay, so twenty-five, ten, and eight to three. Or yeah, alternatively, yeah. he could he could stay on the twenty yep. point and make the eight and bring another one in, or. I think right. he, he wants to keep the midpoint to keep the pressure on Eric's The, the most aggressive play, he set up for he's, bar no, he's just come all the way around, yeah. okay, that gives him sixes and ones to cover next time. If Eric doesn't roll a six, and he's rolled double five again. Right, and that, and that, that looks, this like, looks like game to over to me. That, uh, <coughs> now Mitch has so, got 24 rolls to Yeah, here to comes the cube, the and five. I think we'll find... That's the end of that game. I can't see Eric taking this one. No, it's stripped I mean the, everywhere. The problem is that even if Mitchie doesn't make the, the five prime now, Eric, Eric must needs roll an immediate six. Yeah. six and yeah. he's dropped, so that's one now. So as an object lesson, keeping checkers in play from Mitchie and putting them exactly where they will do what they need to do. So. Yeah, I think it was a well-played game on both parts because... Um, Mitchie was, he played well certainly, but he was very lucky in coming in every time. Yep. No matter how, how strong mm -hmm. Eric's board was, Mitchie was coming in immediately. Yep. So, 4-3. Four, four, three. Three. Yes, Mitchie's again making so. the most aggressive play, yep. rather than any kind of splitting, as he did with the 4-1 in the first three, one by Eric, so... Mitchie threatened to make a point, Eric made one. Now Mitchie needs to come back with make a point making Most it numbers make something. Double three. So he's definitely got to make the anchor because yeah. uh, he's got to get an advanced anchor when Eric's yeah. made the five point. Yeah. And now Eric needs needs to hit or to split. He's got to counter this. 6-2 is a hit. Well, that's even things up. Or I think five, yeah. So again, putting the checker where it does good work. Yeah. Slotting. No, again, it's looking very similar to the last game. That yeah. Mitchy is playing a very pure positional game, but he's he's suffering from a big racing disadvantage. So that was double one by Eric, so he safetyed the block. So Eric's strategy is quite simple. He's going to run away the rear checker when he can. Mitchy is going to try and hinder that. So it makes five point, drops a man down. Standard back cover. He's very good at these double fives. I think he needs to change strategy. 
think the double five. Double was five was good. Good, well, good yeah, for the yeah. race. Um, and the other thing is he's, he's strengthened his board a bit, and it's important in these positions, although it doesn't look relevant, yeah. is that it stops your opponent attacking so aggressively when you've got some threat on the other side of the no, board. No, 5-1, I think, yes, this is going to come out at the 10 point. So it provides a shot to Eric, but it's also a diversionary tactic. Yes, I mean, there's a big game so, here so when Eric runs the back checker yep. out with a 9 so or a 10. So now he's actually got the 9. So the 3 is clear. This is probably six. So ones this and twos to hit a duplicated, sixes to hit a duplicated. So this looks right. Four five, and now Eric can think about the cube after Michi has played his four five. Yeah, now I think you're right to think about it, but I certainly wouldn't double this because he's got two blots to tidy yeah. up. Um, and he hasn't thought about it for very long, but he's tidied them up very neatly with a 6 2. Uh, well, again. what I was going to say is even when he has tidied, tidied them up, up, he might yeah. miss his market, but if he has, he hasn't missed it by a lot at all. for black. And 37, so a 23 pip lead for Eric. Um, this seems a reasonable double. Certainly a take. Yeah, I think yeah. it's an easy take, take because yeah. he's got a standard. He doesn't have a great number of market losing. He's got see. a standard four point holding game. And, yeah. and Eric's got also three got the point there. six yeah. away from him. So yeah. uh, Mitchie's kind of got two ways to win this game. So that take that's double four. Now it's going to take some pressure off Eric's midpoint, but yes, helps one, Michi catch up in the race. One of the things Mitchie really needed to do was to get that third checker on the 21 point into the game. Because while it's stuck back there, then it means he's in danger of just getting into a very bad race. That looks like double one, so it seems right to just... And now Eric now should have a look at the race. race. And basically, if he's ahead by a lot in the race, he needs to clear the ten point like this. So now it's a lot easier for him to get home. But this, this is only right if he's ahead in the race by a lot. 105 plays. He was... 18 pips up after the roll. Right, so that looks like, that like the right, right strategy. And this is a 5 and a 3. Yeah. So it doesn't look right to come out to me. I'll just slot this up. No, I mean, Mitchie. gives too many pick and passes. Yes, Mitchie yeah. needs to get some kind of indirect shot at the <coughs> boy. And it looks as though it's an 8 shot. Is that a 5? Five, 5 1. So no. it can make the 5 prime and just leave. 6-2 is a hitting, I don't, I, I would leave the 6-2 as a hitting number. Yes, I don't I think this I is think an error. Leaving, leaving two shots is, I think, the best you can hope for in this yeah. position. That, uh, I next, think he just missed the play, I don't think yeah. he even looked at it. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, next time he'll be leaving uh, four shots when he tries to clear the 12 point. No, there is um, a, sm sorry, Julian. Yeah. No, and um, the other thing is that at the moment he's he's got some kind of blockage with the eight point that he's yeah. blocking double two and double four and if he rolls poorly he might lose that and then have to give another shot it's when he clears the twelve. Look like, it looks like the right three because now, as you can see, there Eric can hit and cover, but he leaves six eight return numbers. Yes, so that that doesn't look right to me. No. I mean, the two, so, two, three. He should just yeah, save. because the checker on the bar point is going to leave. Yes, he should just likely. safety his blots and yeah. then ask Mitchie to tidy up his position. Yeah. Then then see if he can clear a point. Ooh, double five. So now the race is going to be closer. Well, or was it he, only play, he only played oh, ten sorry, pips of the rest of block. Thank so you, for one. Now I think it's time for the He's pick and pass that he can he can hit on the bar and then pick that same check. So double up. four and one four. Yeah. Yeah. And there's still a blot in board on the other side, so and, it's and the not the end of gone. the world if he gets hit. Yeah. Now he's, he's looking here which one to pick up or maybe to remake the eight point. Now this I think is six shots, which is a lot more than the the three the other way, and there's two blots. So if yeah. he gets hit, then uh, it could be serious problems. One, that looks like a 1-5. One 0-5. Five. No five. Right, so now Eric, I think, has taken all the, all the risks that he needed to, so now the position so, should just come yeah. in easily. So 5-1, he'll make the bar and just slide the checker along to the 2-1. Yeah. Now he'd like Mishi to... Actually, he might like, even like him to go with a 6, so he's got some yeah. pointing opportunities. Now 3 is important. Yeah. 
So Eric's got some funny numbers. He doesn't want to roll six anything with a five. Yeah, the, the problem with this position is he's played five of his checkers behind the anchor, mm. so all he's got is stripped points in front. So he really needs a number that will clear the back point and give him some space. I think double six probably probably uh, is a contender there, Julian. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> does a lot of the work. <laughs> But there's still some bad numbers. 6-3 six, three six, is quite three is fun because he's got to leave a mm -hmm. double shot with that. 6-5 for Mishy. So Eric needs Anything to avoid the 3, three here. Is, yeah. That's not good. 5-2, that's good. So now next time you will have 3, 4, 5 bad numbers. 5-4. So I would suspect Moshi will come, Mishy will come out and in. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good technical play because he's bringing one checker directly into the six point, which is good for the race and good for saving the gammon if things go poorly. And this is a five three. Yeah. I see. So he's got a choice yes. of clearing the six I, point. I, would have but he's a position early. I think you take them off. Yes. There's just adds mildly to the gammon chance, which is very low, but also reduces the number of shot leaving numbers from six to two next time. And he's managed. No, that's fine. Six five, which would have left a shot the other way if he'd cleared the uh, six point last time. Yeah, it's one of these um, double jeopardy positions yeah. because he's come down to two on the on the five point, so he leaves a shot with four one five one and six one now. But he was going to have to come down to this anyway, barring rolling doubles. Ooh, double one. Well, that's a perfect. So this shot. has got to be a gammon opportunity, small though it is. You've got to take the chance. Yeah, so it's and he can play point. completely safe here. So. And he's got to close the point. Many people take checkers off there, but it's much better to have the four-point board that keeps your opponent on the bar for a while. Six-four. So that's probably not going to be much excitement here. This is going to be a single game to uh, Eric, and he's going to lead two-one. Yes, we haven't talked a lot about the score because basically at these scores that are. A level or almost level it's much the same as for money play that there's there you can pretty much ignore the score at this stage uh, a couple of rolls time Mishy will give this one up but you should never give up while there's still a chance and no I mean I think you and I have both played with George Solomersky who's won <laughs> a famous backgammon professional for many years and his rule is you play until it's mathematically <laughs> impossible and then take one more roll in case you miscount it <laughs> very prudent with his yeah. money is George yeah here you go you see three sets of boxes by white while back continues to roll 2-1 so what do you think of the the play so far from what you've seen of the players? So I think Eric has made a couple of minor mistakes and I haven't seen anything wrong from Michi. No, I think Michi uh, has he's tried to st steer the games yeah. into, into complicated positions yeah. and I think done a good job with that. And as you say, I think Eric's made a couple of minor mistakes, but they're only minor mistakes. Yeah. He hasn't done anything horrendously bad. But if you go back to the conversation we had earlier that um, it's these little minor mistakes that add up over time that separate Indeed. the great from the good. Um, so Eric, to my mind, there overlooked a play with, with the 5-1. He, yes. he decided before the roll that he was going to play safe, and he didn't notice that he could make the bar point with the 5-1. Yeah. And as McGreal, Paul McGreal said many years ago, if you don't see a move, you can't play it. So that's why you should always just take a little time. You've got plenty of time here. You've got 12 seconds per move before your clock. Yes, I agree entirely that uh, there's many, many mistakes people make, but just because they don't consider the move, not that yeah. they've looked at it and say, I don't like it, that's one thing. But if you miss a move completely, then that, that yeah. way you're never going to find out if it's right. Right, so that's uh, an opening 3-2 to, to Eric. Well, I, I think that's one of the advantages of, uh, of analysing with XG. Uh, Eric has played the standard, yeah. the standard splitting move, and Mitchie was doing much more yeah. of the... The mistake there playing. is to hit two... Yes. Right. There's only one opening sequence in backgammon where you hit two checkers after the opening roll, and that's when your opponent splits the two back checkers for the 23 point, and you roll 4 1. But other than that, you only ever hit one. So this is 5 4. So what was that? When they split with a 1? When they split with a 1, the only time you ever hit is with 4 1. How about when they split with a 6 and you roll 6 5? Uh, well, I'm splitting in board, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Now what happened there? That was five. Two. Is that a six five? It looks like a six five. So it'll just run away. Yep. 
How about when I open splitting 5 2 and you well double 5? All right. <laughs> and leaving blocks. Okay. Th th this proves yeah. quite clearly yeah. one of the golden rules of backgammon <laughs> that for every rule there is an exception. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even but this. One. Stick Rice has put a, a, this, a very good thing on his uh, BG blog, uh, sorry, um, BG forum uh, paper on, on the opening rules. So it's, it's all based on thousands and thousands of rollouts. So we have some, it has quite a lot of credibility. Support 2, I think. Is not a great role. Yes, I mean one of the mistakes people make here is they try and make the advanced anchor for white prematurely and in position until black's actually made a new offensive point it's much better for white to stay split that it's such a big gain for white when he can he can get a shot and send one of the black checkers back mm -hmm. again. Six four I'll we'll just make the bar. Yeah this is this is better than making the two point because mm -hmm. Eric's keeping all his checkers together, and this is this is to me the sign that you're going to get a, a winning game developing. But if you can see, all all fifteen of Eric's checkers are now within seven pips of each other. This is six one, so yeah. Eric. So Eric should be thinking of doubling here. I, I myself would wait till I've got at least one point in board. You'd be breaking the Dimitri rule many yeah, years but, ago. Uh, oh. Is this 3-2? It is 3-2. Right, so... So he's got the chance to point. Or he could hit twice, play or play safe. And hitting twice is the worst play. Right. Let's just have a look at the race here. 27, 48, 8, 94. This is 124, I think this play is, is clear to me, that while the cube is centred and white well, doesn't have... He would have been hit back. So. That, uh, I think Black can still sort of slowly increase the pressure here, and I, I don't like to leave a shot at all no, in these positions until shots. you have to. Yeah, it's a three-point ball. So she has the choice of running away or making the two-point. Those seem to be the two standout plays. The trouble with running away is that it takes the pressure off Eric's checkers in on the eleven points. Yes, and the, other ones. the problem is as well that you leave one checker behind and leaving yeah. one checker behind is very dangerous because yeah. you can so never anchor. This is correct, it's gonna make two point and again still no double. He's got a few jokers. I think that's six three. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes five. This point. is clear. And now he'll have a double if he's missed, I yeah. think. So Mitchy needs to hit or anchor. If he anchors, if he then anchors, he'll probably then get doubled, but be taking. But if he hits. 5 4, this looks like the end of this to me. Let's have a look. Well, and there's, there's no play here because he can't escape either of the back checkers, and uh, there's just too much of a threat of being being bit blitzed or primed yeah. here. He's going to be nine pips behind after the roll, so he's behind in race threat position. Yeah. So, so to me, this Eric's is got double pass. Everything going for him in this game. That, as you say, he's winning the race. So if he can't get anything impressive with rolls, he can just play safely and win a race. He might roll a double and be able to execute a blitz. If he rolls double four, double five, double six. Yeah, this is wrong. Take. He must double, and and particularly because Eric is is the weaker player of the two, and yeah. he should take adv every ad advantage. Now he's lost his his, mar his market. Now he's actually too good and should yeah. play on. There's nothing that can stop him winning the game whenever he wants mm. to at the moment. Absolutely. Now I was talking to someone in one of the intervals and uh, I was saying to him that uh, when you're the weaker player or you're definitely not the stronger player, then you should be doubling much earlier. Yeah. Uh, I myself kind of use a, a clock analogy. So my standard rule is to double at, at 12 o'clock, but against stronger players I'll double at 11. Mm -hmm. So now Mitchie's come in, but I still don't is, see anything that nothing that would, is ever going yeah. to allow him to take this. So That looks like... What was that? Three. One, oh, so I missed the check on yeah. the 13 point. So Eric's played so safe, which to is the right loose. thing to do. Double five, so this crunches Mitchie's board, and now Eric should definitely play on. Does he want that check on the six point? Is he going to keep it there? Well, I think a lot of people try and save a six in these positions, yeah. and there's no point whatsoever in doing it. Six one. So that uh, might well be his worst. Mm. So he can't leave any shots, and I, I myself would leave another checker outside here. I wouldn't play seven to six, so that uh, 
I, I don't think there's there's too much wrong I'm with this right at this. all. I yeah. So the only thing is dangerous, dangerous six, six one six or a two. Then there's a two, and now you'll, you should double and yeah. pass because there are no. Machine yeah, you know, I get put off by the race, but the the race yes. isn't too important here. That uh, three point hole. It, that's, that's, I was saying about any three point game is a take, but this one isn't because once your home board has gone, the variations where you hit and then win have largely disappeared. And certainly, if Moshi doesn't, and Eric's it's still rolling on. This gives Mishi a chance when he, he really doesn't deserve it. Yes. The, in the past, for the last few rolls, we could have argued about about not doubling because yeah. it was too good, because there was he could win a gamut. But now, now, Mishi is anchored. Double five, no no play. Yeah. And he really must double. I can't yeah. see why he's playing on. You know, the chance that Mishi hops out with one Eric points on him and then wins the gamut. So well, he's out with one, and now we'll, and now we'll see catch. what his, his must cube catch. plan is. That. Uh, there's still very yeah. few gammons here, yeah. Okay, so that's his pass. So, small mistakes again by Eric, yeah. but I don't think they're big ones. I don't think that uh, he's hand mishandled it terribly. He's given Mitchy one or two free rolls to find double six, but that's about it. Anything without a six in it, and Eric's pointing here, so... Uh, 25 numbers point on him, so... That's quite a lot, and double six is pretty good, so... Is it not even close to a take? Yes, I mean, I think the problem is that Mitchie's got a, another checker in the outfield. Yeah. So even something like double two or double three, where he just brings all his checkers in, then he just wins a race routinely there as well. So the score moves on to 3-1 right. to Eric. So now I think Mitchie has a slight, slight imperative to double early, but I don't think it's anything overpowering yet. That I myself would still sort of follow follow normal rules with cubing at this stage. Yes, <coughs> once the game moves from one to two at this score, it's fine. If it ever moves to four at this score, then the score becomes relevant because a doubled win with the cube on four for Eric, for example, will win in the match. So, but most of the time, we're going to be a long way from that. Checking. Yes, I mean, one of the things I've noticed recently about backgammon scores is how important it is to be a number of points away from winning. And the number of points is, if it's if it's a power of two, it's very good for you in the score. Mm -hmm. So two away is very good because you can win an undoubled gammon. Four away is because a doubled gammon will take you home. And eight away when a, a redoubled gammon takes you home. Right, so Mitchie's managed to make the five point. And very shortly on the other table, Moshi is going to start playing Falafel and the Super Jackpot. They're both, uh, they've just come to the table. It's an awkward 4 1 that Eric has rolled. Yeah, I, I, like, I like this play. play. Yeah. Like this He's got to do, do something about mm. this, this yeah. five point that, yeah. that Mitchie's made. So he's looking for a six. He's got double two. <coughs> so the question the, is, does he do the this? Point is clear. To keep them connected. Yeah, I, 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 I like this play, mm -hmm. especially with stripped eight points. That's the mm -hmm. key thing for me. That look, most of the ones going to look hits That's give lots of returns. Six and one, I think. So now Eric really wants to come in on the 22 point. That's one of the features of these positions I was explaining to him Three before. 3-6, not too bad, but uh, so he's in and out, which is right. So none of his other sixes play particularly well. That looks like double six to me. That's so it's a great role. It's potentially a likely eight. winner because yeah. now he's escaped all his back checkers and he's the only one with, with pressure. Eric needs an eight or a seven to even think about probably taking, so let's have a look and uh, do the race. Hello, so I know that everyone was keen, hello this is Zoe, I'm back, um, everyone was keen to look at the falafel moshi match which is now starting, so we're going to switch over to that match, are you guys yeah, yeah, okay no, to carry fine. on? Yeah, yeah. fine. All right, brilliant. Yes. Is it possible to change the screen so we can only see the, the match that we're watching? 
so we can get that full screen. The it's just a problem with reading the dice makes it a little difficult. So if you could do that, that would be good. If it, you can't, it's not the end of the world at all. You'll be able to see what everyone sees. Yeah, but that's, that's what yeah? we want. We okay. want to be able to read the dice. All right. I will see what I can do. I hope that's what we want, Chris. <laughs> It's a little small, right? So in the other game, as we leave it, Eric is leading that she three two to eleven. Right, and no. Okay. On the other match, which has now begun, uh, let's who's playing who? Moshi is playing the red checkers. Falafel is playing the white checkers, and the first roll was four one by uh, so Mochi. Falafel is playing the white checkers, Indeed. and Mochi is playing the six red. three. And so the trick is for Julian and I to find a mistake here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think first of all, we should say this is you, you've now got the three best players in the world all engaged in matches. Yeah. This this match is the the super jackpot semi final. So the super jackpot was a thousand thousand pound entry, sixteen players. So there's a total pot of sixteen thousand. And I think Chris will agree with me that of the two semi finals, this is the stronger one. Uh, since we have the, the world number one <laughs> playing the world number three at the moment. So, no double. No, oh, but a, a cracking roll from Falafel. And uh, Moshi will have to roll well here. Five two. Is that yeah, enough to keep one. him in the game? Here comes the cue. And one of the differences between Falafel and, and Moshi and some of the rest of us is a lot of us would have to do a lot of thinking here. Falafel knows instinctively that this is a cue. Um, he hasn't obeyed Moshi's rule of taking 12 seconds to think about it, but yeah. maybe he's using Moshi's play to think about it. Uh, Moshi has some defence. I don't know if you um, have any view about the, the strengths of these players. That um, It might be my, the limited number of matches I've seen, but I seem to get the impression that Moshi does very well against Falafel. And uh, it, I guess it might depend on the size, my small sample size, but mm -hmm. uh, I mean they're both very, very strong players. And uh, the major difference I think is, I was watching a match recently on the internet where uh, Falafel was commenting on the World Championship final with Mochi against Lars Trubolt. And he was describing Mochi as a machine, that Mochi is just churning out the, the computer numbers as mm -hmm. Falafel sees it. Whereas Falafel, when you listen to his commentary, he's a much more intuitive player. That, you know, sometimes he'll look at the thing and say, well, I don't care what the computer says, whether I should double here. My opponent looks scared, he might pass, that I've got to double. Right, this is Chris Bray just leaving, because I've got a match to play in the London Open, so Julian's going to have to hold the fort here on his own, which I know mean, he's well capable of doing. Right, so second game has started and Falafel's managed to make his bar point and send another checker back. So that's a, a clear edge. Are you joining us, Sean? I'm going to join you. Excellent. So, hello Julian. It's, uh, hello viewers. Good to, uh, good to be here again. It's been a slightly running around so far. So what's happening, Julian? Well, I think we, we're very lucky that we've got this match, which is, as I said earlier, the number one and number three in the world as they're rated sort of from a few weeks ago. So it's, it's certainly backgammon of the highest quality. And this, I think I was saying this was semi-final of the Super Jackpot, and they're playing to 11 points. That's yeah. right, so uh, £16,000 at stake. Uh, so uh, not an inconsiderable sum of, uh, sum of money. And it's a very important match for each of these two, because I think... They would both consider themselves favourite against whoever comes through in the other semi-final. Yes, yeah, I think this is clearly the uh, the stronger part of the draw. I don't think uh, anyone would, anyone would disagree with that one. So it looks like Falafel's taken an early lead. Well, he he managed to win the first game with a big double five, and he sent lots of Mochi's checkers back here. Yeah, okay, and this is interesting. This is really where the Mochi wants to play this kind of game. That it's a long game and. Uh, this is one of these things that they, they call online a pointless double because White's got no points in his board at all. But we used to laugh at these until the, the computer has come along and said that they are very powerful. Now I was, I was told this was called the Dimitri rule. Yes, there was a, 
a, a Greek player used to play in London called Dimitri Cordulu who laughed at people when they doubled without a point in board. But, and I, uh, I actually know this, Julie, because I met Dimitri. He yeah. came to the tournament at the Hippodrome a couple of weeks ago. It was uh, lovely to yeah. meet the, the, the man who... The legendary the, Dimitri. Exactly. <laughs> right, well... take? Yes, that... Uh, you like the take? I'm not sure. I, I wasn't very keen on it myself because I remember one of Stick Rice's rules that says sort of, you know, it doesn't look as though anything can go wrong here, but Stick was saying that through bitter experience he's learned that when you think you're going to get a back game and getting the second point is certain, then uh, it quite often happens that what you think is certain, the dice don't necessarily agree with. <laughs> <laughs> well, how right. would you play the 2-1? Double well, hit here? This is a... I, I would hit and make the five point. That, uh, I think well, Falafel is thinking. You think this is a bit big? I think, to be honest, both of these players are, are better than me, so I wouldn't wouldn't argue too strongly with the moves, but I would have made the five point with the hit here. But, uh, Come on, Julian, we're going to have to stick yeah. out. We, we can't just agree with every play that's made on well, the uh, for basis. Fortunately, that, uh... <laughs> there's no computer here to argue with me, but uh, <laughs> Falafel uh, didn't come out well from that exchange. That, uh, He's, he's ended up with another check is sent back and he hasn't got his five point yet. And I think he's regretting doubling now that it, his position looks a bit stupid, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So can you see what the four dice two. are? 4-2, this is a 4-2. Right, so he, he's going to be doing some hitting and he's choosing which one to, to send back. I think he can do a double both, hit, he can both. hit on 21 and 11. I can't see why he, he's taking some time over that. That looks a clear play to me. Do so, am I missing something? No, I, I, I agree. But Julian, I was going to say, perhaps Falafel was just treating us. <laughs> I mean, actually, if we've got the two best players in the world, or two of the three best players in the world, this is the sort of game we want to see. We don't want a boring holding game. We want some real action yeah. in a sort of mutual back game type territory. So Falafel's come back with double three. That's a great shot, because now he's got all his checkers in, and he's made the five point, which of course, we would have been several rolls earlier yes. and not have gone through the sweat. <laughs> That's right. Mere, the mere mortal play of making the five mm -hmm. point. Yeah, it's, uh... So, um, Mochi's obviously pr pretty keen on his take here. I think he was keener before this double three, but uh, uh, Balak was having a little look at a play that doesn't make the five point. I think his theme <laughs> in this game is to try and avoid making the five point. <laughs> Not play like us mortals do. That's right. This, this is very advanced play. <laughs> okay, so no, he hasn't. He has he's made he's fallen point. for this beginner's yeah. mistake. <laughs> so presumably the anchor. Is it? Is it three four? Three four. Yes. Right. So we we have to make the anchor. But, uh, whatever the standard we play. That, that's strange because Mochi isn't one of these players who. Uh, who normally plays the first half of a move that's forced automatically and then looks for the second half. I think he's trying very hard, isn't he, to play touch move now? Ah, so, right, so yes, I, think I remember he's, that, uh, uh, Yeah, so I, I think he's probably, he had got that mentally, that was clearly first, but he wasn't playing it until I it see. worked out his, his second. I'm not sure about that. I mean, to me, if you have the opportunity to get a free look up, I'm not entirely yeah. sure why you wouldn't take advantage of that free opportunity. No, I think it, it all yeah. depends how, how people's brain works. I myself am very bad at visualising things, so I always like to move the pieces and see what the position is that I'm accepting or turning yeah. down. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I think with this position, I think it's fair to say Falafel has a small edge because He's, he's got the, the five point, he's got a solid three prime, and he's got three checkers back to five. But in exchange for this, he's given away the doubling cube. And I think of the two, owning the doubling cube is, is better than the, the positional edge he's got here. Okay, that's, that's interesting. But it, it's certainly turning out to be an interesting game. That uh, Both players have got lots of checkers back, there's lots of contact, and it's not a case that... Um, someone is just racing or rolling a double to win the game, there's, there's a lot of play. And the main, the main feature of these kind of games is that you want to control the outfield, because that's all the checkers have to pass through the outfield. So you'll find typically that the players will be jumping over the prime and occupying the outfield. And you saw with the last move that Falafel made a point in the outfield. 
you know, that he's given up his anchor, he's not worried about being blitzed because Red's already got five checkers back. And what's more important to him is occupying the outfield and threatening to occupy it. Absolutely, and uh, this is uh, this is the sort of very sort of positional struggle that I think both players would relish. Yes. So now, and this is this is going to be complicated. This is. So that's the yeah okay. So, so with the last move, Mochi came up and came into the outfield. The same thing, and Falafel's driving him out from the outfield. And Mochi fans, but that's no problem at all. He's still got his anchor, and Falafel's a long, long way. Now he's extended it to a four prime. Now he's making progress. So and uh, he'll really want to split here, won't he? That those five checkers away from the rest of the army. If he can, if he can split up, then that will be big trouble for, uh, for Mochi. Mochi needs to keep his checkers connected. So what have we got here? This is a four two. two. So he, there's a potential hit here, and I think you like the hit. I mean, no, no. I think no. the reason why he's hesitating for this is because if he does hit, then he he gives up the midpoint and he just leaves two blocks in the outfield, and he's in very severe danger of his position getting completely split in two. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So the problem is if he doesn't hit, what else? <laughs> is he <going laughs> what else do? can he do? Um, so maybe just uh, on the high anchor and then 6-4, something like yeah, this? That's, that's yeah, that's precisely what, what I think the right play is. That there's no reason to rush the back checker up, that we might need that there later. And we know we're going to want a strong board somewhere in the game. But, uh, quite often it's a mistake to put checkers behind an anchor, but here it's a case that because he's made the five points, that the only points we can make in board are behind the anchor. So okay. he's, he's chosen to come in on the two points. And he, I, I don't like this move. I don't don't want to check on the two point. That isn't the natural place for me. And it's just extended that to a five prime. So this is starting to look more ominous now. Starting to look more ominous. And we see RF uh, in the background there entering the match into uh, XG as they go along. Um, so we'll make sure we get that match file and uh, publish that on the website as soon as we can. We don't have the, uh, the benefit of XG, unfortunately, in the commentary box. Well, that's, that's good for me. I'd much rather that uh, we can talk our, our own opinion and not have the computer interfere and say, no, we're talking rubbish. That's fine for you, Julian, as a good player. But last time I did this last year, everything I said turned out to be horribly wrong. So uh, <laughs> it's more embarrassing. So Falafel's made a lot of progress now. He, he's broken Mochi's army in two, and he's still got his five prime and Mochi's gradually being eradicated from the outfield. Yes. So, even if Mochi gets a 1 and makes his 4-2 makes his back game, it's not much of a back game at all when it's stuck behind a 5 prime. It's just out with 2, I think, here. Yeah? It's certainly uh, Falafel's yeah. first instinct. So now we can see that the, the game has, has worked out exactly as Falafel would have wanted. He's, he's bringing his 15 checkers round, he owns all the outfield, and Mochi's forces are completely split in two. And I think the only thing that would stop him doing that is whether he, he's worried about some sort of hit in the outfield. Whether does, does double six hit him there? That's, that's the thing that always worries me. That, uh, when your opponent has a hopeless game, you can, you can worry about the one in 36 chance that will swing him round. This blocks the double six, doesn't yep. it? Yep. So, uh... I'd be no. worried staying back there, sort of, um, well, I mean, a, few, a few double threes, but... <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> that, the problem stuff, is, when you, when you rush wrong. the front check around, then you, you've got to get two out into the outfield together. It's much better to bring all the three of them round together. Yes, yes. So this is, this is a double four, is it? It is indeed. So, uh, so some sort of shuffling of the back men there. Uh, Yes, I, I think he's hesitating because the, there is a potential blitz here. He can can switch and put two checkers on the bar, but I, I that looks a bit. Um, it's a bit bit iffy against yeah. a three point board, and I, I think I prefer this approach. I'm clear I prefer this approach. So now I think he's wondering. I mean, the, the play is clear. It's, it's the same as your play. It's, uh, it's fourteen six, and then uh, sixteen twelve twice. 
but falafel might surprise us. He might come up with something ingenious that's that's better. He's certainly thinking. Um, yeah, there must must be something on his mind. Yeah, I suppose he can split in the outfield and hit loose on the two. Yeah, I mean, I was that, I mean, that, that had occurred. I mean, it's. Um, so now if he comes in 12 to 8, he leaves this double six, which I, I'd be very scared about, because at the moment he's got the game won, and you really don't want to leave a position where if he gets him come out with double six, and now he takes the outfield and has lots of checkers to move. So 4-2 so here, so... Uh... So Mochi's got to decide whether he's going to take the risk of leaving his checkers back and try and get this 4-2 game, or whether he wants to bring one out and try and try and jump the prime. And I think at the moment when we looked at blitzing with the double four and decided that it was it was too much, that tends to me to indicate that he can afford to leave the checker on the 23 point. Yeah. And he sees it the same way. 4-3. Right, so Falafel's looking at the loose hit now. That, uh, there's not a great danger in this, because even if he gets hit, it's it's very difficult for Mochi to contain him with, uh, with so many checkers back. So now he's looking at the safe play. And we've, we've had a question about Falafel's cap. <laughs> Where do you stand on wearing a cap, Julian? And uh, you know, in the, in the backgammon playing world, well, it's it's. We've not seen Eric McAlpine and Falafel, of course, with mm. their caps. It's not for me, I'm afraid, in terms of attire. But uh, <laughs> Falafel is one of these people who, uh, despite being a very intelligent person, hasn't quite figured out which way round to wear it his goes, baseball no. cap. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that question. Any more coming in? Please, uh, please do. So this is a double three. Right. So. Mochi's managed to get a, a guy into the outfield and survived. Yeah, okay, so there's a hideous like double five here for White. Uh... So So the checker on the twenty four point is protected by the, the twenty one point checker. So yes, yes. So I, I I like this. I can't can't see anything remotely close. So. To me, this position now is that uh, all we know White is going to win, and all we need to do is quantify the magnitude of that. That. Uh, and do you come off the twenty-four point now against the four point? Board? What's what's six got? three? Right. I don't think there's a lot of difference in the plays. To be honest, I think if you stay back, you'll probably win more games, but obviously you'll get, get a gamut. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm I'm a very cautious player, and I would definitely come up here. The crucial factor is the the points that are that have been made, which yeah. is that Falafel's made the two and three points, so he's got plenty of spaces to land his checkers, and which means yeah, and he, and he has come up. We can see that. So he's paid twenty four, twenty one there. Uh, okay, so there is one of those awkward fives. Yeah, as you say, that uh, this position should be routine for Falafel to bring home, provided he avoids rolling fives. <laughs> and of course, you know, nine times out of ten in those situations, or at least it feels like that. Ah, double six. So this is a blotter. He's got to leave three shot. Yeah. So this is this, this is, is minimum shots. That's his, his basic strategy there. He's missed. Right. And the good news for Falafel is that that should be the last shot. And that now he's cleared his difficult points, and uh, he should come home safely. Uh, now is it five, two, or three off here? Here, I think it, it's Safety. best. It's best to stay even on the back points. Yes, but, uh, I mean it's double four, double five, double six, all these shots, and they're great numbers. Where you know you're thinking of possibly winning a gamut, and it's a big swing if you leave a shot with this. Yes, yes. It's a six-two here. The only bad number. 4-2, so... That's, that's second worst. Yes. <laughs> he's, he's got no checkers off and he's had to create a gap. 
So you were saying it should be safe, but uh, there's no such thing as should, is there, in backgammon? This as, is as you say. Is, when <laughs> it, it's 99% home, then that means you probably only lose 10% of the games. <laughs> So six one five one four one six two five two. There's one of them. It's yep. six two. It's a shot again. Yeah. Well, this this is. is it six? I think it's a five two. Doesn't it? This is definitely two. the last shot. Ah, uh, there's. Uh, you said well again, double one, double two. Mm. It's, uh, but yeah, you, you you think that was unlikely. So can he get this safe here? He has. It's uh, five four. Okay, and this is now uh, this is now routine. Right, so Falafel's got 13 checkers left. That will take him five, six rolls to get off. And that looks as though mochi has got ample time to bring his checkers round. This should be um, fairly standard plays on both sides. You wouldn't expect to see any errors here. This is the sort of thing that these guys will do in their sleep. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, mostly. it's by no means trivial, this gammon saving. That the, the simple rules I have for this is that you... You try and land exactly on the six point and you maximise crossovers. Yeah. And provided you can do that, that takes you a long way to making the best play. So here, I don't think this can be done now. This is, uh, this no, is this safe. is 100% safe and absolutely no wins from no. Ochi. <laughs> so they're just uh, rolling it out. <laughs> Yes, one of my favourite quotes in Backgammon was from Kent Goulding when he was analysing a match and uh, someone asked him as to when you should when you should resign a match and his rule was um, when the chance of the ceiling falling on your head is above your chance of your winning the game then you should be resigning. <laughs> and that makes it's, a lot of sense. It does, yeah, no, I, can, I can see that. And I'm pleased to report that Kent Goulding does still have his head intact. <laughs> so the rule works. <laughs> Okay, so three two here. Um, we so see, uh, see the split. Falafel's opened up a, a three nil lead, and uh, as we said in the uh, the earlier match, it's it's not too consequential at the moment that lead. Would uh, if the score was the other way round, would you come down with a three two, for example? Um, I myself, I I tend to wait until there's a four point difference in the scores before I I start adjusting my plays too much. Okay. So uh, five one. So this, and, uh, this looks like a very creative play by Falafel. He's looking to duplicate fours. This is his idea, rather than try and run home and play safe. He's trying to develop a position at the same time as well. This play I kind of like actually. That uh, the important thing is he's unstacking his six point, which is the heavy point. Of course, with all good plays, he gets hit. This looks like a, a four five for, for Mochi, so he'll definitely be hitting with the four. And I think he's wondering whether to to unstack the midpoint or to hit a second checker. And I think for me it's clear with 4-5 that we, we actually hit twice because there's two other white blocks in the outfield that uh, uh, I'd be certainly itching to get my hands on. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, and that he's, uh, he's, he's, he's listened to you. He he's sees it the same you. way, yeah. You don't think they can hear what we're saying in here? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're quite a long way away, aren't we? Uh, okay. So 2-6, so he's only brought in one. And now Mochi has got sixes and fours to hit in the outfield and sixes and fours to yeah, hit in the Yeah, obviously we're seeing this key. Yeah, and the, the key point here is that uh, Falafel's got absolutely nothing. That despite his flashy play of coming out and slotting the five point. And he takes, so he's... Uh... I, I think he's right to take because Mochi's a long, long way from winning this game. He's made sort of a point in board and he's stuck a blot in there, but... He, he hasn't actually sort of got anything of a prime or a blitz position at all yet. But he, I think what he's doing is he's threatening to get a game where he's going to be winning for a long time. And there were certainly one or two jokers there. You know, you give him yeah. double four, double six, and he could wipe Blackwell out. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Just in, uh, just in the other match, they're taking a break. Eric McAlpine is leading Mishy four to three. Um, we obviously, we've chosen to show the falafel Mochi match, but just to... Um, uh, just to reassure people at home, both that match is being recorded uh, and uh, we've got video footage of it as well. So, um, so you will be able to watch that later on the, on the replay. But we are going to stick with Falafel Mochi. So is this a 6-4? Is this, a six four? this is a 6-4. This, this kind of looks clear to me. that I, think it, I, would, I would wipe out the checkers in the outfield straight away. 
And he can point on the two point. I think that's presumably the other thing he's looking at. Well, he's, uh, I think he's thinking about it, isn't he? I yeah. Mean, it's, uh, yeah, and we can we can see there. Do you have an opinion on this? That uh, oh, I like your play. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought it was pretty clear to me, but. Um, you know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the world number one. So if he no, sees I mean, things differently, yeah, it's, uh, there, yeah. there, there is an argument for making the two point. Is that it? Uh, it stops him anchoring, and the checkers in the arc field aren't going anywhere. If we have a three point board and two of our opponents' checkers on the bar, we should have ample time to round them up. So I think that's why he's hesitating. I think he's, he's going to go after the arc field checkers in the end. But uh, it's it's definitely worth having a look at the other play. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he might surprise me and prove me that prove me wrong that by making a two point. Uh, it's taken a long time. So one of the things we saw, of course, in uh, Mochi's last game that we streamed is he uses a lot of time. Yes, I've read some stuff Mochi has written about time management, and despite despite the fact it looks as though he's absolutely crazy with his time management, he spends a lot of time studying the concept and figured out when you should use your time and. Well, no, I'd heard a counter argument to that. Now, I, I know the, the sort of the, the view from Mochi. I know sort of heard Bob Coker say, for example, that um, you know you know you don't know if you're going to get to the eleventh mm. match, so you might as well use the time to start with. Yeah. Uh, the, the flip side to that argument I heard was, well, of course, the ma the uh, equity swings at the end of a match matter, whereas of course you know uh, a big blunder at eleven away, eleven away doesn't matter nearly as much as a big blunder in a double match point in yes. terms of the equity yep. you're throwing away. So, but but you, you you think that that's not the right analysis? You think the right analysis is? Yes, I mean at the time I I was on the other side, uh, let's say against the Coker side. Oh wow, like, double three! Wow. Right, so uh, the game has gone on. He's hitting the outside outfield oh, as we suspect. Yeah, and hit so two four on the bar, four one pick and pass. Not a huge amount of ammo in the zone at the moment, but of course he will just bring checkers down and yes, he can and, he can bring yeah. checkers down with tempo and. There's no points Falafel has made on the other side, so Watch is quite free to be hit easily. He's just going to hit on the five point and bring another checker down. So one. what's the level? It's, it's four? Clear. It's four two. Okay, so he's nine to five, thirteen, eleven. Eleven, yeah. yeah. We, we agree. I'm not sure what he's thinking about too much here. He's going to play that. Yeah. Four uh, checkers. The, the only other point. play was to pick and pass, but I don't think he needs to pick up. No, the it's not with, not with no real, uh, no real counter So there's a two. So I think with three six that Mochi will, will yes. point on the two point. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And the order of the points, not it's the three six. You absolutely yeah. called it, Julian. <laughs> it's so you you don't need to be able to read the dice. You're calling play. it. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is a six five. So just in. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, in, six, in blitz it's like this that they get to the stage where the value of the points gets reversed. That's a nine, but six three. Wow, making so, it five. Previously, sort of normally, you want to make the four, five, six points, but at a certain stage, you're, the points swap in value. And the idea is basically, if your opponent's going to make an anchor, you don't really mind if he anchors on the six point because then you can just bear off past him and things work out fine. But if he anchors on the one point, then he's in the game to the end and you can lose it. Yes. Yes. On, the, on in the game to the end, of course, a reference there of the, the ace point that uh, Bob Wachtel wrote uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a pamphlet on that. I hear he's re-releasing it. So uh, it's yes, but, uh, I understand he's he's actually adding something to it now. And um, from my recollection, the original book was was written pre-computer era, so yes. there were wasn't any computer analysis, and you basically had Bob's opinion, which is is very valuable and uh, very good, but. Uh, I think nowadays when you can add computer numbers to this and um, come up with a, a clear proof about it, then that's very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So um, updating it with the, the help of the computer age is, uh, is good. So um, back to um, back here and again, just trying to bring this last check around remote G and make the four point. Those are the, those are the, the, the goals. Absolutely. And the, the key to these things is that sometimes you have to worry about your opponent's jokers, that uh, they can come in with a double and hit, but here because he's got four on the bar <coughs> he doesn't have to worry about that. He just has to figure out the trade-off about not getting the last checker. Yeah, and sometimes so, it's, it's your anti-jokers you need to worry about rather than the other guy's jokers. Yes, it? yeah. it's, it's, it's particularly annoying when you get to a position like this and you've closed your board and then you roll double five and double three and immediately having made your board you have to break it immediately. Absolutely. Now the the big danger here is that because he's got no board, that uh, Mochi will be try thinking about trying to win a triple here. He'll be aiming for the backgammon, that the gammon is completely assured. If Falafel had got a strong board, then Mochi would be playing safe and clearing the back point early. 
But here he doesn't fear being hit early on. No, I mean, this is an overwhelming position, isn't it? So, uh, you know, to try and... And again, I mean, that's the sign of really, really strong backgammon players, isn't it? They try and eke out every last drop of equity yes. from the, the position. I mean, people like you or I would be celebrating and saying, isn't it great we won a gammon and got four points against the left ball, whereas Mitchie, Mochi is looking at it and thinking, sort of, how can I get that extra two? And that's right, to really want to eke out that, yeah. uh, that backgammon, yeah. So, double five. So, double five, two, and two off. Yeah. Yep. So the idea is, even if he rolls a six, five and leaves a shot, then Falafel will still have to bring in three checkers while Mochi brings his one checker round. And it's a double four. Okay, so he's got to play six to two and he's got to play four off. And I I wouldn't keep the six point there, that you'd leave a double leave gap. Leave a double gap, and yep. a double gap is considerably worse than that single Yeah, gap. but the other problem is now he'd, he'd be down to a three point board when he leaves a shot. And previously we were looking at it and he'd have a solid four point board, which is a lot easier to contain for that ball. But now the, the chance of getting hit is that you might actually lose the gammon and then you may even lose the game if you get hit. So here I think a bit of caution is called for. I mean, he's not giving up on the backgammon completely. No, and you, you can tell me, but he's thinking about it. And again, yeah. you know, and, uh, another sign of the, uh, the very strongest players. He doesn't make the move automatically. He thinks yes. about it. He, you know, it's... Um, Yes, I mean, as you say, this move would be automatic for us, but it really shouldn't be. We should be looking at the play that gets the most on. I wouldn't quite put us in the same bracket, mm. Julian. You are, of course, a giant of backgammon. It's, uh, but uh, obviously Mochi voted number one. Um, Falafel number three in the world in the least recent Giants. Uh, yourself, Julian, in the, in the top 64. Fantastic. Um, so one of, one of our two UK Giants. I believe there was some talk earlier. Right, uh, so we've got some action. Oh, oh, that oh we can be hit might, here. He might be it's winning uh, a backgammon and he might be being hit. That's a hit. So let's see how Falafel contains this. And, and of course, again, so the containment, you want to contain that last checker. Um, you want to try and get off the G, but uh, I mean, I guess just containment here, because I mean, of course you don't want to be backgammoned. I mean, you know, yeah. a, if you don't, you've got to be. So there's a lot to think about here. A number of different things to be, yes. to be I mean, weighed the, up. The first thing I think that comes to my mind is that um, although he's left, left a shot and been hit, that Mochi has got um, ten checkers off. So Falafel at least is he's going to have to get to get to a close out before he can even think of doubling. Yes. Okay, so it's a double four, but that's fine. Six one. Right, so that's a poor shot. What what Falafel wants to be doing is unstacking his heavy points and getting checkers into play here. And he wants to be building up his board. And this isn't a role that helps him in those goals. No. That first of all he can't hit at all, which is bad. And I don't think he wants to leave a shot, so this is this is a good play in terms of making a prime, but a bit scary on leaving the shot. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're a bit worried when he, you get hit here. He, he doesn't mind being hit and he doesn't mind red escaping, but he doesn't want him to do both at the same time. And it's a 3-1, that's a terrible roll, so that's, that's good for Falafel. Keeps this game in play. This is a 4-1, wow. That's a good <laughs> that's the, I didn't get much better than that. Uh, double four maybe, but uh, that's lovely. Okay, so straight to the edge of the prime again. So for that we'll be hitting with twos. And double nights. two, double two, and this yep. has really gone as bad as well as he could have hoped, really, here. Indeed, and he's uh, he's turning it round from certainly a potential six-point loss to a two-point loss, at least. But, and I mean, the, even with the closeout here, that uh, the Mochi's still the favourites. So. Yes, the, the thing to understand in this position is that Falafel is working at extending his prime from the back, that his, his back jackers are so far away from the action that he can't really aim to push the prime forwards. What he wants to do is try and try and contain from the back. So he might have to let Mochi jump the prime, then hit him in the outfield and slot the back. So you is this a five six? Double six here with six five, but that's obviously not the right uh, the right fault. He, he's looking to hit Mochi off the front, and I don't like that play. I like uh, I myself would make the midpoint immediately with this five six. Oh, okay, okay. That uh, that jumps to my mind. I mean, one thing is that um, all, all Mochi's other checkers are on the ace point, so if he rolls 6x, he's got to progress all the way with that checker. I think, um, the more I look at it, your play of blocking the double sixes looks the best. This, I mean, it's jumped out. I mean, if I was playing the Blitz, this would be the, you know, kind mm. of, um, 
you're going to get other than six four. You're going to get a double shot out with the with any six. Yeah. Now the challenge here is, of course, he does want to at some point hit the guy from the from the front of there. But uh, so no, as I say, the the easiest way to win these positions is to actually wait till he comes out, then hit him in the outfield and slot the back of the prime. So yep. here we go. So this is this is now the five and the three. Three, five, eight, eight and thirteen. And that okay. looks like a ten, that which is a bit of a lemon. Is, is not quite what he was aiming for. So, I think my my view is move the front checker all the way. Yeah, this doesn't leave a direct shot. Leaves no, good still coverage. Have some coverage. Yeah. yeah. Now I think if Mochi sneaks the checker home, he'll still be in gammon territory. He's looking for oh, eight that's or higher. Terrible. And he rolls three. So, yeah. can Falafel hit it this time? Two, five, and ten. So about 20 shots. There we go. He's, uh, he's got it this time. And yeah, and he'll just split again to give the coverage at the back of the prime as you were uh, as he was explaining. Okay, well that's a great number. Uh, three six probably any better. Okay, now he will of course. This was a double yeah, five. Yeah, yeah, so of course that's, that's, slot the that's back. His yeah, best. so this is um, for two six, much he wants to see now. He hasn't three three. So four seven and twelve to make the six prime. And that's the seven, right? So there we go. So now, much he's still a favourite, of course, with with even with the closeout with ten checkers. Off. Yeah, the, the, my, my reference position is that with eleven checkers off, that it's it's a bare take. Yes. Uh, that is the player with eleven checkers off can double. Yes. Now here. Um, Uh, okay, yeah. so there is the closeout. That, that was routine. I think he did that with double three twice. Yes. Just to roll it to <laughs> now, we've been looking at this and saying that uh, with 10 checkers off, Mochi is, is a favourite in this game. With 11 checkers off, he's about 75% favourite. So with yes. 10 off, I think he's probably around about 70. So understanding this, that what Falafel's got to do is he's got to try and bear off aggressively. Yes, so he, very quickly. So he wants to put them on the high points and he'll yeah. take the man off the five. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he's not worried about leaving a shot with double five or double six or double anything. One. He knows so, he's got to get checkers off. So I learned from Lars Travolt, the rule about these positions, is the first part is that you keep as many points closed as possible. Yes. And the second rule is you take as many checkers off as possible. <laughs> but that, that is a rule in terms of precedence. So yes. it's keeping okay. points yes. closed yes. Is, yeah. is the important thing. Yeah. So that, that's useful. That's very useful. I, I, you never you never volunteer an opening. I knew that. Um, no, so I mean, there, there's yeah. some exceptions, you know. So if you roll a double one and you can take three checkers off and open up a point, that's, that that's, right, that's, that's a winner, okay. yeah. Okay. But two checkers off and opening a point is probably right. So what's he got here? Five, three. So five off, six, three, or five off, three off, or... You know, this is um, not entirely clear, is it? So five or three off is what we've played. Um, oh, that was the three, but it's cocked. Yeah, that, that looked a bit strange. That I yeah, would have thought five off and six to three, maybe. Yeah. But no, I mean, he kept a four-point board and he got two checkers off, and I think that's that's the best he could have done on my previous algorithm. Yeah. So this is a six-two, is it? It is a six-two. Right, so keep going. I know. I, he's thinking I about think the banana. This is, this is this is crazy play. But, uh, there's no other checkers to yeah. pick up. And he's no going to hope to hit, isn't he? On yeah. The, uh, well, the eleven yeah. away is the is the mac, is the best place apparently. That uh, if your is opponent's that a climb, got, is that a, it yeah, is yeah. yes. If you've got to move, your opponent's got to move the back checker. That's the only thing to move. So, okay, so, so he's got max. He's got eights, right? Yeah. Six shots. That's not it. So no, he's, so he's staying stay as back. far back as possible. It's getting tricky. He's, no, he's, he's, uh, he's just getting tricky for the crowd. He's, uh, he's not really going to play that. So that's that's actually good for Falafel because now he's been sent back and he gets another chance at this shot. And he hits it. Oh very good, so double threes, okay, well that's nice, straight out. So he needs to he needs to perform again. 
It hasn't. Right. So, so this should be reasonably routine yeah. now for Mokri. But uh, on the positive side for Apple, he's, he's losing two points compared to losing a potential six, as it looked like a while back. Yes, yes. So, so yeah, uh, it's... Um, you know, he was one roll away from a backgammon, and he's, he's cut it down, so he's, he's four points better off than he could have been. As uh, is so often in backgammon, I think it's probably be a game where everyone's disappointed. <laughs> 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 So uh, two big doubles, double five or better, all the even designs, and he's missed it. And that's it. So uh, the score goes on to three to two. Three to two, yeah, and that was uh, that was a that was an interesting game. Yes, it, uh, it looked as though Mochi was uh, was firmly in control and uh, rolling home to a to a gammon with a potential back gammon, but. Uh, I mean, one of the things with these strong players is that they, they understand when to take risks. And although Mochi finished up only winning two instead of a possible certain four, um, his, his chance of winning six was more than his chance of going down to two, should we say. So I think it was a finely calculated gamble on his part. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, so. Five makes the five point. Mochi opens with 3 4, bringing down builders, and Falafel splits. And the important thing here is that he's got to attack those two blocks before they start making points. So Mochi makes his 5 point, and Falafel hits the remaining blot. This is a 6 5. Okay, so clearly he comes in with the 5, and I think the 6 is I think it's straightforward. You've got to play to the 18. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so you, you play to the 18 rather than out to the 14. Yeah, the, the, the trouble is he's got a double shot on the 14 point, and yeah, although okay, you don't right. don't yeah. normally want to walk into these stacks, you you've got the board advantage at the moment, and the exchange of hits is very good. Yes. Okay. So it's a five four. He's going to hit on the uh, seven yeah. point. Yeah. That looks like a, a bad shot. I would classify it as. Yeah, because he really wanted to sort of double hit there, didn't he? On the sort of seven and five, if possible, three one. So that's that's rubbish. <laughs> it is well, rubbish. Twenty two five is clear. Yeah. And there's a lot of attacking potential here. Those big stacks, the split checkers, six three again, not a good roll. So now that now is the first key decision. That uh, does he want to come up or does he want to? Hit? And it builds with a race lead, doesn't it? That you don't really, and one checker back, and you're leaving a lot of shots if you hit now on the five point. Maybe mm -hmm. just. Yeah. Do you want to hit shimmy on the up. three point? Or shimmy up to the twenty one, I was thinking. Uh, I would go up to the twenty one, yeah. yeah. But I, I would like the, the duplication here as well. That the numbers Mochi needs to make the anchor are twos and fours, which are the numbers are involved in hitting yeah. on the twenty one yeah. point. Yeah. So and Falafel's thinking, I mean that's uh, yeah, the, not clear. The not problem clear. Falafel's got is it's not his kind of game where <laughs> you end up with nothing. You know, he'd like to play a game where he's got sort of a prime against some strong board or something like that. He doesn't want to be in a position where he's got nothing and all he's doing is having to roll numbers and to run away. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he, uh, he's looking at it and he thinks he's got to play it, doesn't he? You, you're right, he doesn't like it. It doesn't come naturally, but yeah. he knows it's the right play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 6-5 here. So this game, some some of the games the players seem to roll perfectly every time, but this game it seems that they're rolling something akin to their worst every time. Well, in some ways, of course, that makes the, the, the best decisions. I mean, you know, if you can hit blocks and make points, backgammon's very easy when you're yep. rolling those perfectors. Yep. It's when you're rolling the bad numbers that you get the difficult decisions. Yeah, that looks like the best player. I would have come out to the 16 and look for the 5, but I think this 5 is better. So oh, this, this is, is double deuces, that's, this is, that should yeah, be the finish. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, it's going to be a double pass, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Well, it's got the five point. I mean, you know, Red's got the five point. He's no, I mean, I think I would really. think Falafel is thinking about whether it's too good. That um, okay. He's got a stronger board, he's got two checkers back to one, he's got his opponent on the bar, he's shooting at a seven shot. I can't see this as too good with that five point made for Mochi. But maybe, well, it's obviously if he agrees with you. He agrees with you, Julian. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would probably be worried and want to cash it, but uh, okay. when you watch these good players and you commentate on them, you've got to say what's going through their minds. Yes, that's what, right, what's, what's, what's going, going through mine, yeah, yeah, you know, I would have just cashed. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is, okay, so now this is just as expected, that the Lampel hasn't had an instant choker, and now he's, he's certainly not too good anymore. No. Now he should be thinking, he's obviously thinking of doubling and he's wondering whether he should. 
Anne, I think the double is clear. I think the question is whether what she can take it. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, I would, I would be turning this cube every day of the week, particularly against Mochi. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh... So Falafel must, must still be thinking, is he too good? You know, he's wondering whether he can roll a 2-3-5 combo and his will point on him that... Uh, nice. I, I, I can't see any reason he, he wouldn't double. You know, the only reason would stop him doubling is if he thinks he's too good. Yeah, we'll, uh, we shall see. Um, so I mean, he's got you know, he's got the three point board. He's got the eleven checkers in the zone. He's got, as you say, the escape man, and and he's he's carrying on. Yeah, so he rolled a poor number, but nothing much has happened. So, yeah, that's, that's that's a clever play because it's it's what I call the the even eight because he's blocked the three five as well. Yes, and the uh, double five is blocked, so it, it's only even number combinations. Yeah. So what is this? And is not this, double two, of course. This so, is uh, four three, is it? Four three, it is yeah. four three. So I think the play here is to make the two point, and I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but uh, I like the idea of making the point in board. That, uh, yeah, I mean the thing is the sort of the, the slot, the sort of eight four thirteen ten, you know, that just encourages Falafel to attack you, yes, doesn't it? Yeah. So you, you don't, you know, at, at a time when your opponent is ready to start whacking you, you don't want to be yeah. leaving vulnerability no, in your uh, own board. A very cautious play of playing 13-6, which is the idea of trying to get as many checkers home before you get closed out. Well, you can look at moving the 22-point the checker forward some, some distance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't like that idea. I don't like going out to the 18. It gives us much more chance of winning, but much more chance of getting gammoned as well. Yeah. And going out to the 15 looks the worst of both worlds, because we don't have any threat at all. You know, the Palapal has a chance yeah. to hit that checker, and if he doesn't, then he cashes. Oh, he well, he has slots. Right, he's gone for your play. Yes, and, yeah. uh, this was way down on my list. <laughs> uh, no, Palapal is definitely That's, thinking uh, he's too good, but he's rolled yeah. 6 2, which is so a bit again, hopeless again. Yeah. So now I would think I am just going to play yeah. safe and cash it next time. Cash. Yeah. Okay. But he can play to the 11 if he wants to, because uh, there's a blotting board. Oh, I think he's thinking double, about the hit. The double four is the hit and cover. He's not thinking of hitting it. Hitting is crazy here. Yeah. No, he's not thinking of hitting it. I saw his hand. In that wobble. direction, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah. You're right, he probably was thinking of hitting it. <laughs> uh, he wants to go it for crazy, it, but he, yeah. he knows yeah. he's got to restrain he himself. And, we'll, and, and Mochi's she's still not able to anchor up on that 22 point, so, but he's so, made yeah. a four point board now. Okay, so now Falafel has to catch. And yeah. Okay, he's, he's two okay. rolls after I would have been catching, but uh, he's, I think he, he's justified playing on. It didn't work out this time, but yeah, uh, but nothing's gone sort of horribly gone wrong. For no. Him. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so we're at four two, and we see uh, Mochi and Falafel looking around. They're hesitating. It looks as though and they're, one they're, or both of them want to break. They're wondering what they're doing now. Uh, I should say, part of the reason they might be looking around is that at some point people are going to be thrown out of this room that they're playing in, but they've got um, they've got special dispensation to carry on playing, actually, so uh, so they are fine. And they're looking, there's a few, they're looking, there's a bit of nervousness, everyone's looking around. Uh, I think they know that they're just going to carry on. You know, they, they, are, they are looking around. Um, okay, no, so and they're off again. And the 3-2. Yeah. So that was spend. Mochi making the, the, the safe play? Time, yeah. Yeah. Six three hits, of course. Yep. Two one, not the best. Just make the 11 point here, I think. I, I think this is one of these exotic plays when you play 23 in the Ah, ah yeah. okay, there you go. Good, good knowledge of third rolls there. Well, it, it's clear to me it, it's duplicating the fours. The important thing is you want to unstack the six and if you can get away with duplicating the fours at the same time it's the right thing. Okay, interesting. So this is four two? It is a four two. This this to me is a genuine choice that he has to hit with the four and now he decides if he wants twenty one or eleven. Or the point. eleven. Yeah. So he's taking a, a risk in not making the anchor but he's made the point six away from Falapple's potential anchor. Falapple hits now of course with the uh with three checkers back and the safety of the anchor, he's, he's going to be going all out for, uh, for those good points in his board. 
Double five. Okay, so this is a, a poor roll, I think. That, uh, it's it's usually good for blitzing, but uh, Blackpool's not in a good position to execute a blitz yet. I think he'd much rather have just covered the four point. So what do you so do? So he is this? hitting on the yeah. ace, and uh, he he is playing this. Uh, well, he's certainly thinking about the. Yeah, the blitz I, I don't type like this play. play. I'm I'm wondering whether you can just play thirteen to three twice and keep the fewer game. I have so thought of that, Jimmy, and I, I agree. With, I, I, that was my, um, again, the, the, the sort of four nanosecond play was the, just yeah. to make the three point here. Um, this, I mean, this is so overextended, isn't it? It's, there's not enough checkers in the zone. Um, you, you've, you've started to have your men, I mean, you've got three men back. It's difficult to blitz with men back because you've got to bring them round. You just yeah. don't have enough to. Yeah, he's he's settled for it. He's seen yeah. his he has, our way. Double aces. Now, that is not a good shot. Usually it's a brilliant shot, but he can't get at the blot he wants, and he can't make an advanced anchor. So, do you think maybe make the twenty-three and switch to the seven? Yeah, and that's um, that, that's that seems to be the. Uh, so now Pelapple's okay. got one or two good numbers. He wants sort of six two, six three, something like that. One, four so one hits and covers. No, yeah, argument. I think he's got to hit, doesn't he? I mean, you don't, you don't like to break that eight point, no. but um, but I mean he's. But he's, he could. He's I mean, it's always game, shuffle. Got a three exactly, point and you're board. not you're not going to shuffle up here, are you? Twenty. No, it's only a six to five. That's that's the other play comes in contention, but. That's a slot, yeah. Sorry, slotting, of course, is better. Yeah, yeah. That is. Uh, oh, well, he's in the this, this is this. And he rubbish. shuffled. This is rubbish. He yeah. shuffled. That's my third choice there. It's, uh... No, that was falafel. I, I disagreed with one of falafel's plays. I yeah, well, we we can officially uh, we're record it that there. One. That's that, right. Okay, that that was an officially a rubbish play that yeah, falafel yeah. made. Okay, okay. <laughs> And he's looking up and looking at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He knows he might be getting pilloried for that. So now what? We've got double, double threes. Yeah, yeah. So now he's got the five point or the seven point. And, and this looks very block, good block against the twenty-three well, point uh, anchor, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, but typically the you and I both know that the five point is the five points. Yeah. And you have to be in the world's top three not to make the five point. <laughs> not that, <laughs> you. <laughs> Yeah. If you and I played this game and we didn't make the five point, then that, people would be right. coming to us afterwards and saying, right. "You fool! Why didn't you make the five point?" That's the strongest board you can have. The six five, uh, you know, sort of the strongest four point board rather that you can have. That's uh, it's got to be a good argument for not doing that. Yeah. So that's. But this is a good blockade. Yeah, I don't think Mochi is ready to come off the twenty three point yet. He's got plenty of checkers to move. Yes. And if, if we make the seven point, how are we going to make the five point? Are we going to roll double aces? Well, double six. So this is uh, this is not good. This is pretty useless. Yeah. So I think he goes to the three and makes the ace. Yeah, that looks uh, right, doesn't it? I think he's getting doubled after any play for sure. And he's not too good here. Yeah. How did my plan of making the five point come out? How, how did that work? Yeah. Oh, we'd have lost our eight point and you'd come out with double yes, six. Double yeah. six is going to be fine. So the one roll, the one game roll out there, Julian, is uh, is not good for you. Yeah. But, uh, so is, is Falafel hesitating here? I mean, one thing that's different with these players to me is that Mochi sort of people call him a machine and a computer, but Falafel. Um, plays much more of a psychological game so yes. for him it's not so much just what the position's like it's sort of like you know will Mochi be passing next roll and should I hesitate before cubing yeah and I guess that um, I mean I guess that comes from just having played so was that, was that a double three again it, it, it was uh, yes it was double three yeah so that I think strikes me as a play of a man that wants to cash next roll that um, he's basically getting his back checkers out, he's not sort of making the five point board or anything, he's saying sort of, yeah, that uh, I'm going to give up on winning a gammon and just catch the thing next roll. Yeah. He's looking at the camera. It's, uh... So this is a 3 4, is it? And. Uh... This yeah. is 3-4, uh, yeah. Yeah, three, I can understand why he's hesitating, because if he hadn't slotted the three-point, his play would be easy, that he'd make it. But uh, with two numbers to make it, he can he can cover and then play somewhere else. So. Mm. And you like three and four here? Is that, that the play? Or three and two is the other play, I think. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not convinced by, by any of them, really. I don't mind that play. Well, I'm going for three and four is the, the number one choice. Three and two uh, kind of threatens to make a worse point, but it gives you a better distribution to do it. But this this is watching all over as we were talking about time that he'll spend a lot of time about yeah well, what seems to be quite a small decision well, well okay so he's right. that was a big decision okay yeah. so he's right. right that is a big so decision. whatever his rule about uh, these things I don't think he's hit the clock has he I think he's just played this no he's hit I think he's pretty sure yeah. he's hit it and Flaffel Flaffel's looking at this he can't believe it he thinks this is crazy. I mean, we, 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 we know Flaffel will be telling Mochi as well mm -hmm. if he thinks this is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, we, we're telling him, how could you play this? Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. He'll be saying, how could you play mm. this? And now he's looking. So, I mean, for Apple's understanding that he's, uh, he's changing his cube plan here rather than just cashing. He's looking at it and wondering, should I, yeah. can I cash, should I cash, or is it too good now? So yeah, I mean, he's got the, he's got the race, he's got the position, he's got threats. Um, you know, this is clearly, you know, very, very strong. So, four, three is, another 4-3, four, 4-3 three. Four, three works, yeah. It's useless. <laughs> okay, 4-2. So now he is just going to make that three point, and by, just by 6-4, I yeah. don't. So and this is this is really the question that uh, what has Mochi achieved by this? Has, has he actually had any winning chances for the, the potential gammon risks he's taken? It doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, even the racing plan doesn't seem to work. Mm. I mean, uh, see, see, how do you win? I mean, so you, you're not winning by racing. You might, you could hit a shot, but your board's is, is the race that's, that's, uh, bad? You, I, 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 I don't know what the count really is. I, I haven't counted. It's looked bad. So ace. So two choices. Is it ace double two? two. No, it's double two. So double two. Choices. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, you again, can, you can make the five point. We did say yeah, that was quite yeah. a good play to make the five point. You yeah, can you blitz can make, here. Make the five yeah. point and switch, yeah, or make the five point and hit loose, yeah, or you can hit loose yeah. outside. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, this is um, this is a play with lots of uh, lots of different options. Yeah. My style is to make the five point because I'm I'm quite keen on the five point. Yes. And then to switch points in board. Yeah. So you've got a four point board. He's got the blossom board. Board yeah. blitzing. You've got this extra checker to pick yeah. up in the outfield. If he dances, even if he comes in, you know. Yeah, but gonna as I say, my my, roll, my yeah. style is very conservative. That I, I give him nothing. That I'm not going to leave any blocks, I'm not going to leave any shots, I'm going to put him on the bar against a four point board and yeah. see, see what he can come up with. Yeah, and I, I think I mentioned earlier that um, you know it's often it's the bad rolls which are the most difficult mm. to play, but of course the exception to that is the doubles which can be enormously good rolls. Yeah. I mean whatever he plays here this is a great roll, um, but this, obviously there's this, just a lot this of is options. This more yeah. style. Uh, Very pure kind yeah. of, yeah, so this is we keep finding the best and blitzing points, um, and yeah, yeah. And at the same time it's exciting, it's, so there's more gammons this way and more losses, yeah. more counter chances, mm -hmm. but he's got away with it, okay, yeah, he's and found, covers. And, uh, covers. and now this is obviously a very strong position. Yeah, again we were talking about anti-jokers, so the only problem here is if he rolls one of those numbers that's blocked. And, uh, so now he's wondering whether to slot the bar when he was 6 1. That's what's on his mind, I think. Yeah. Double one, of course. We'll having the, well having the three checkers on the seven point is not where he wants them. But um, no, I wouldn't pay the 1 6 that it's. Uh, yeah, so you don't want him coming out with tempo. Double one, one, you don't two, mind one, him four. coming in and hitting you in the outfield, but you don't want him coming in and out with tempo. Doing everything he needs to do, yeah. giving him the role to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you let him do that, then you fan once and suddenly he's in control of the game. Yeah. Okay, so now he's got the second check. Yeah, and now he's he, making sure he's got something to hit him with on the ace. He doesn't want him anchoring on the ace. Yeah, well, he, he doesn't like having right. three checkers on the eight point because now he's got the two, he doesn't need the eight. But he doesn't want to go deep. One of the most common mistakes I find weaker players play is that they just go deep in their board much too much. You yeah. find strong players, they'll put checkers on high points, they'll slot high points, they'll take risks to make high points, but they don't like going deep. Keeping that flexibility. Yeah. Okay, and so... Uh, so he's got two builders, he's got double six plays safe. 
so watching Cantina yeah, yeah. Falafel will hit him loose with any chance at all he's got and again I mean Falafel will have played this theme thousands of times yeah. thousands and yeah. thousands of times you know this is uh, so Mochi brings one in, which is good, he might anchor, but he might get some more checkers sent back. But overall it's a good Four, shot. Four six, so double hit. His so best he, chance is to yeah. anchor on the 24 point. Uh, so Falafel will, as you say, be going all out to stop that happening. And that's not an ace, so cover here and then... Uh, so what have we got? Three and six, seven four, so it's not a cover. So I, I would actually risk going to the two point here. I you don't would. want to go it's, deep, uh, but okay. it's, it's so important. Way around. Yeah. Okay. This is probably the computer will actually like this play because now we've got some big numbers covering. It gets yes. us tens to cover and the computer's quite like that. Likes Just those extra you know, shots which you might not you know, kind of be counting yeah. up. And you, you there solve the counts. problem yeah. of escaping yeah. the back checker once and yeah. for all is the kind of idea. Double five, so he will switch here. I know, you know, okay, you won't. Yeah, I think his position's so strong he doesn't need to. He doesn't to need to, okay. He doesn't want to leave the double six joker. The, the, joker, yeah. the double yeah. one yeah. joker is he's, basically he's, gives he's him not. a game, yeah, yeah. whereas the double six joker leave, gives him with a very good game. Yes, okay, that's. Uh... Right, well, this if, is. If uh, Mochi had a stronger strong. board, he would go the other way. If Mochi had like the three, four, five, six points, then there's much more caution needed. Yeah, but that, I mean, that gap's huge on the five and four point there, isn't it? I mean, there's this, this sort of the six, three, one, double five blitz game really yeah. does leave well, a we, huge Well, we saw Mochi do up. quite well in coming in. I think he managed to hit two or three times and it, it achieved absolutely nothing. Yes. It just sort of slowed for that down. And again, he doesn't need, he can just play safe. He's the gammon's wrapped up. Yeah. yeah he doesn't need to. With two on the bar, yeah. he's not going to win a back gammon. So with all these checkers in the outfield, he can play relatively safely yeah. and just sew up the gammon without any problem. So I think again on our one game rollout we can say that Falafel has done very well on this. That yes. He's proved his argument for playing on and he's proved Mochi was set. <laughs> he looked a bit baffled when Mochi broke his anchor and exposed two blocks. He did. I mean, he, he really looked like he did not like that. That is undoubtedly but, uh, true. I think we, we all understand now why he, he seemed rather bemused by this play of Mochi's. But no doubt afterwards we'll see what the computer thinks. and. The computer generally tends to agree with Mochi, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, strangely enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mochi seems to know what he's doing. Yeah. It's, uh... Okay, so, yeah, this is just. Uh... So he's not going to leave anything again, I don't think. So what, what's this? 2 1, sorry, yeah. so yeah. just play it absolutely safe. Yes, when I talked about aggressive bear offs and I said the objective was to take maximum checkers off and keep maximum points closed, here the Falafel's got the gammon sewn up, yes. so he's playing a defensive bear off. And yes. a defensive bear off is you play for maximum safety. Yes. You don't worry about taking checkers off or anything like that. You just make sure that you know if you can bear off safely that you'll win. There's this sort of sweet point in the middle, isn't there? So if you're definitely not going to win a gammon, you should play safe. If you definitely yeah. are going to win a gammon, you should play, play safe. safe. Yes. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's the bit in the middle when you yes. actually start to make the decisions, when the gammon's in question, yeah. that you actually have to start to take some risks in order to be able yes, to but ensure it. This is, potentially take yes. as you say, and this is one of the the high concepts of get back gammon. I think people, when people start playing, they say sort of, well, I've read McGreal, I know how to bear off safely, there isn't anything else. You know, why are these other people playing badly? Yes, yes. Yeah, you wouldn't believe what I saw this top player do. Yeah. He took this two, guy, check, this two guy checkers is the off best left in the shot. world. Yeah, yeah, left yeah. Potential double six shot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's, I mean, that, exactly. I mean, backgammon is a game of trading. You know, it's, uh, yes. you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's weighing up this risk and reward. So the score, I think, has moved on to six to two now, has it? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's uh, significantly. Not yes, the, there was a, a strange uh, moment at the end of the last game where they got a bit confused and the score moved on to 3-3. Three, three. But then they figured it should be 4-2 for that fall. Yeah, they've, they've, they've worked this one out. So, so from 3-3 uh, from three, three, he's gone up to 6-2 now, so that's that's a big improvement. So uh, again, we were talking about Neil's numbers earlier for sort of working out the winning chances here. So the Neil's number for 9 is um, 5 and 2 thirds. Mm -hmm. So 5 and 2 thirds times by 4. Uh, which is 20, uh, 22 ish, ish. 
Uh, you add that to 50, yeah. so 71, 72% yeah. winning chances. So actually, you think, oh, the, the score seems quite close. Actually, already, Falafel is now a big favourite in this. Uh, okay, so this we're saying sort of 71, 72%? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, yes, so this is the sort of score where I was saying earlier I used this kind of clock analogy, that this is the sort of, sort of score where I'll be doubling at 11 o'clock rather than 12. Yes. That on Mochi's side, he wants to be doubling one roll earlier than normal. Mm -hmm. and Falafel's side, he wants to be doubling one roll later than normal. But it, it does depend on the position at all. So mm -hmm. there's no need for Mochi to double sort of boring positions. The race is holding games early, then yes. he, it's unchanged. And similarly for Falafel, for Falafel, he doesn't need to be shy doubling those. Yeah. So this is about when there's the gammon. So it's about when there's those, those big cubes potentially yes. coming. Yes, when up. there's yeah. big gains and also um, lots of potential losses. So this has gone perfect for Falafel, that he's, he's got to a boring type of game, and whatever he says Falafel about sort of not understanding things and being a, a dumb American, he understands clearly in the match play that this is the sort of position you want to get to, where there aren't going to be any gammons, and he can just sort of slowly inch home from here. Well, if I was one of the uh, best and biggest money game players in the world, I'd probably be telling people I wasn't particularly good at backgammon <laughs> yeah, <yeah>. either. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he freely admits he's a yeah. money game player, but he'll say, sort of, you know, all those funny things in matches I don't understand, whatever. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a whole area of study, isn't it, match play? I was, uh, was uh, yeah. sort of commenting uh, earlier to, to one of our players downstairs around uh, you, you have a very uh, uh, good understanding and explain it very well, the concepts of match play, particularly gammons in sort of the five-point match, etc., and how they how they work and how the cube changes those yeah. gammon values and changes the, the sort of the value of the position. Yes, I mean, my personally, I kind of think sort of, although the computer says that backgammon is split into two halves in check, and cube strategy. For me, there, there's actually three elements in backgammon. I break it down into check and play, cube strategy, and match strategy. Yes. And, you know, people can play very good cube action, and for money games, they understand the cube clearly, but when they go into matches, suddenly their error rates shoot up, and it's because they don't understand how the cube changes according to matches. Yeah. Now, some positions you want to be doubling at certain scores, and some positions you don't want to be doubling. And probably, uh, I mean, I guess the, the most obvious example for me of this would be, say, the okay, two so away, four away. We've got what have we got here? Four, three? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. not, not that much happening. <laughs> it's just playing No, that, well, uh, Mochi's yeah. escaped one checker and he's trying to escape the second He's one. made the five point here. So, I'm not really sure he's thinking about it. He's going to so, what have we got here? 30, 43. He's going to make the five point. There we go. 99, Teasing us. So that was a six, was it? Yeah, that'd yeah. Be right. So the race, race is about, about level at the moment, yeah. yeah. Five-one. So Mochi's still got this trouble with this, this odd checker, he's got stuck back. Yeah. Well, it's kind of this, when the race this close as well, you, you know, you're thinking, you, you don't really want to race out into a shot because... You don't want to race yeah. out into a double shot, precisely. Yeah. But, um, you know, leaving him there, of course, is, is, is also asking for trouble. Um, so this is 3 1, is it? Yeah, That's I mean, he's not going to hit 6 to 2, so is it? Yeah, yeah, just something boring, I guess. So he's, he's keeping flexibility and maximum attackers on the 20 2 1. Point. So he doesn't escape and a rubbish racing roll. So I think maybe 7 and 6 here is my play. That, uh, yeah, that you kind good. of want to have some sort of a prime to protect, to protect you when the hitting mm -hmm. starts, but you also need to get checkers in because of the race. Right. Uh, now and just probably just the pick and hit and cut. Yeah, because the, yeah. the threat on the other side is too much. So, Raffles playing this game very well, despite the fact it's against his style. He's gradually inching it home and giving as little as possible to to Mochi. Two ones makes the four point. Yeah. So now he's got a four point board. Now he can start eyeing the cube, but. Uh, for me, I'd, I'd still be eyeing it at the moment rather than, rather yeah, than picking it up. Gap on the three and on the seven, and I, I'm not sure for how close the race is now. It doesn't. It still looks fine. It's, uh, double fives makes a difference, of course. So now I think uh, we just we make the three, three obviously, for sure, yeah, yeah. and reflexively I would make the ten. There's some argument for switching just because we're going to double next time. 
0.63, so that yes. comes out part of the way, but that leaves like 29 yeah, shots. So you can't do that. So no, he's, he's actually he's reasonably he's, he's quite safe back there without any, or at least for a roll. Uh, well, this this doesn't look very good to me at all. I haven't counted the race yet. So what have we got? 73 to 54, 74, 5, 7, 9 is the lead. So this looks like a big pass to me. And the reason is that um, there's some threat of immediate priming. Uh, the problem is, that, you know, suppose Falafel gets a bad number, what does Mochi do then? You know, that he can run with 6-4 or 6-5, but that's about it. Um, you know, he has so, so few chances here. He's basically got to survive roll one, then he's got to roll a precise 6-4 or 6-5, and if he doesn't do that, he's, he's got 32 numbers where he's going to survive roll two, where he's threatening to make the bar. And he's nine down in the race already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, no, it's basically uh, yeah, what yeah. I call a race plus it's position. It's 99, 108, isn't it? Yeah, so that's, um, yeah. You know, you might be able to eke out a take in the race if it was a pure race, but the contact is definitely all against you there, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I 100% agree. In that. Okay, so seven to two now. Now the score is getting exciting because Falafel is, is four away from victory. Yeah, so a doubled gammon is, uh, is perfect for him. It takes him right there. Yeah. But I think more typically, as you say, a double gamut for him is good. But notice how with the five-point lead that Falafel jumps up to the 20-point at the first opportunity. That he's not worried about anything else. He's got to get off the gammons first and then see how many points he's going to win or lose on the game. Yeah. And here comes the cue. Wow. So we've got to uh, figure out the race here, so that's 40, 53, 69, 93, 98, 106, 88, so 18 I make the difference. Okay. So but these positions with a sort of five point holding game with the bar point made, you normally made. need about, you can take up to a race deficit of about 20, yes, yeah. precisely. We've read the same books on Yes, this. indeed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, 18 puts us in range, and uh, to be honest, uh, although people get shy in, uh, with a big lead like this, this is exactly the sort of position where yeah. you're very keen on taking. And this is what you were saying, I mean, it's because there's hardly any gammons against you. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, the other good thing about these positions is that they used to be called by by Kent Goulding, the, he called them the, the good, bad, and ugly positions. Uh, that was the, the current film when he came yes, out with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the idea is that you can win in three ways. Uh, I never remember which is which of the good, the bad, and the <laughs> ugly. But uh, basically, you can you can get a direct shot and hit it. You can get a shot at the midpoint and hit an indirect yeah. shot, or you can win the race. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the significant thing is that the only the only time you get to use the cube is when you win the race. So when you, you've got a direct shot, you can't double. When you get an indirect yeah. shot, you can't double. But when you catch up in the race, you can cube. Yeah. So the and the reason you can't double is, of course, because you overshoot your market by so much when that happens that the guy's just not taking it at that point. Yes, once yeah. you've hit your shot, yes. you, you've overshot by a lot. Yeah. But when you, when you catch up in the race, then you get a lot of value out of the cube. Yeah. So being only 18 down is, is not so bad. Although people sort of think, you know, 18, it's hopeless. It's these three ways of winning all add up, you know. So if you've got three to 10 percent, that's 30 percent. Oh, well, that was a double five, so that's very good for the race. Uh, of course, that can mean that he gets forced off the anchor a bit earlier mm. than he wanted to, which um, starts to sl slightly push up those gammons. But, but um, uh, as yeah. I say, I think he would much rather have the race. I think he's calling yeah. that a good number. Yeah, no, I, was, uh, I would agree. But 6 3, so he can go. I don't think he will. I, I think he will, and I, I think, think he, he should. Will. Yeah, that, um, basically, okay. it's. It's a three point board. He has board a strong board, moment, yeah, of with course. A yeah, with a block. Yeah, yeah, all of these things argue uh, very strongly for, for going. And there's a lot of the red checkers have gone past the action, so it's not as though that there's a lot of spares sitting that's, about to attack. And, that, and that's really where I think the key is, isn't it? It's that volume of checkers in front of you which is yeah. still whacking and he you has in some positions. And he has, well, you're quite right. Yeah, so, so, crucial uh, roll here. 6 2, so he is going to cover and hit here. He will, of course, cover and hit. There's no, I just, he's going to cover and hit. 
Well, uh, he's he's going to need to see what the race is. I mean, it, it, is it clear to you? It's very clear to me. He's going to cover and hit with a double five forty. He's going to cover and hit. I, I, I agree. I mean, it's yep. clearly a race dependent play, mm. but um, I'll count I, it. I can't see another hit. play. That, that is the problem. <laughs> I mean, if you're not going to do that, can you can you see anything else? Again, it's my fault. Oh, you can just clear the back play. point. That's that's safe, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, no, we we should count it. So that would be forty five. Eighty-four, yes. So he's got a race lead here. So he has, that's he that's has a good reason not to volunteer his. shots. Okay. So did we get to eleven? Was that was that? Yeah, yeah, was eleven. Wow, and bang, double six. Okay, so now you wish hitting, you'd hit. hitting was better. You think the one game <laughs> rollout again? I'm uh, pleased to be vindicated by the one game rollout. So. Okay, so now I should say my decisions are never vindicated in my own game. It was eleven before, but he's rolled four. That's seventeen against yeah. now twenty-four. So now we beat by seven. Which can't be enough. It, it must be enough to me. That uh, I mean, the race is a lot shorter now, isn't it? So 35, 43, 50, But to give the recue to four when oh, it's seven to ahead. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what will he pass to here if he passes to nine two? Nine two. So two away, nine away. It doesn't quite work on the Neil's numbers anymore, does it? Needs for, for two but away. But what, what is the the basic number there? If it's so, uh, what so did you say? For it was nine sort of is five, five and, and a bit. Thirds, yeah. yeah. So if it will be five seven thirds, point eighty seven. five, something like that. A bit more. Yeah. 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 So. 85 plus five, 90, just under ninety, about eighty nine percent, something like that. So. Uh, yeah. But. We think that's going to be a little high, don't we? Yeah. That uh, you've got to adjust down somewhere. And put, well, and of course, because the VQ back does take him to 10 7, not to, to winning. So ah, he right, to, yeah. yeah. So, so he don't, that's not a pure take point, it's actually right, his take so points higher than that. Yes. Because yes. he can't just. I do know a clever action. rule with that that um, if here when he recubes, he'll go to 10 7, he'll be 81%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you work out your pure take point and you say then, that is then 81% of your real take point. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah. it only takes you to 81% of victory. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Right, so it looks as though Falafel's borne off all his deep checkers, which means he's rolled some several small numbers. So he's, he's ahead in crossovers, but he lost a bit in the race, so I don't think he's ever doubling this now. No. So what have we got? 42, 50 on the other side, that's easy enough. Against 34, 46. Yeah, 46, 50. Right, so four pips and one of the checkers. 11 to 15, four checkers. Yeah? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, the checkers were meant to be worth two pips when they mm -hmm. when they sort of worked out these formulas. So, four yeah. and eight is 12. Is um, So, if we use that 12 and four is 16, is 256. It says that he's getting up there, doesn't it? But, uh, so this is close. Yeah, so he's now looking at it. He, he's going to going to fulminate over this. I don't know what fulminate means. Yeah, but he that's didn't what fulminate he's for do. very yeah. long. Yeah. And Mostly he's going to fulminate. As, I uh, think in this case, what it means is you better give the problem to the other guy. Yeah. And that's <laughs> the way Falafel yeah. would see it. He'd say, sort of, you yeah, know, well. Not, I mean, <laughs> be honest, Falafel's not looking. I don't know. He's. Yeah, I mean, he's. Look at him, he's, uh, I don't think he doesn't look, I mean, is this, is this falafel, typical falafel, is this, oh, I'm going to give it, you know, a bit of the old, uh, the drama to, to yeah, try and fool yeah. the other guy, yeah. you know, it's, uh, yeah, so I've had a match against falafel in, in France, and it was a doubles, and uh, he gave us a cube, and he sort of turned around and looked to his partner, and he says, so the double, what have I done, how could you let me double this, we got three checkers <laughs> under 24 point, how could you let me do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a um, little bit of trying to... Uh, my, my partner, Peter Bennett, says to me, sort of, you know, well, this score we should pass, Julian. I said, well, you know, he's got three checkers on the 24 point. <laughs> <laughs> and Falafel talked me into taking he it. He talked you yeah. into it, it's yeah. It's a big pass, uh, about yeah, 1,300 yeah, 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 okay. And, uh, <laughs> That's why he's so good, you know, yeah, and yeah. as you say, the psychological mm -hmm. game as well as the actual game. He gets inside the heads of yeah, his opponents. Now, Mochi, on the other hand, this is, is where I, I bow to Mochi's knowledge that yeah. 
it's the area of the game that Mochi excels in. So he's going to work out precisely what his take point is to to one, if not two, decimal points, and then he's yeah, going to work out yeah, his exactly. Win chances and he'll to have the same uh, level of, then then he'll have yeah. all the adjustments for the checkers, mm -hmm. the checkers off, the gaps yeah. in board, the wastage that he's got yes. for the extra checkers on the ace and all points. These things with be, uh, pipples and hundreds uh, of pits and uh, yes, yes, all of those sorts of things, and then. 17 different counts, you know, the ward count, the Keith count, the, yes, the uh, ball count, count, the Kleinman count, then take an average of the counts and then... <laughs> <laughs> What's your gut feel on this? I think he's going to pass. Okay. That, um, I think Mochi will probably regard Falafel for all intents and purposes as an equal opponent, so yes. he will he will work through all the numbers and he won't bother with any adjustments. Yeah, but he'll just come up with the maths. Whereas, yeah. like, whereas, exactly right, whereas if he thought this was close and he was playing probably most other people in the world, yeah. then he might well just say, I'm going to Yeah, just, there's just other things this. to do. Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the things people don't really understand is that these might be the best players in the world, but in terms of bearing off their yes. absolutely equal <laughs> Average, you or That's I, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. When it comes to their dice rolling, they're, uh, yeah, equal. So what, what do you what, think? What, what, what would you do over the border? He has passed. passed yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's the, the reverse. So good, good the double by Falafel. Yeah. But uh, this is is typical Falafel that he might not understand what's going on, but he understands that he's got to ask the question. He understands yeah. pressure. That's right. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, and I think what was clear to us when we looked at it was that it was definitely a double. We don't know whether it's takeable or not, but we know it's a double. Yeah. So we do get to this two away, nine away, and, uh, again, so Falafel a big, big favourite, but we've seen Mochi pull back from these scores, so, yeah. so this one thing is... So notice that at this score Falafel is playing the split with 4-1, the standard yeah. move, but he's not doing anything aggressive. What he wants is to try and make an advanced anchor and have another one of these boring games where he can roll a big double and win that way. But uh, the last game went out just as we expected, that he, he rolled a big double to catch up in the race, he survived being attacked, rolled another big double to come round, and that was the end of the game. Yes. Uh, well, and of course, he can get the undoubled gammon here. So he's attacking. Uh, because he'd split his back checkers, the uh, double six, not as good as it usually is coming out to the 18. Oh, point, so that was a double six he pointed It was, yeah. So, um, right, Mochi's got a guy away. So this is, is a very difficult game to play now, because he's kind of... Half of him is saying, I want to be blitzing, so yes. that I could win the undoubled gammon. And the other half is saying, well... You know, I want to win a single game, and I want to make sure. Uh, well, and this, I this, don't this, this, and this absolutely embodies this this choice, doesn't it? Either the two point or the race. Mm -hmm. I mean, that embodies it. That choice right yeah. there. And but I, I like this yeah. play because he's he's not given up any points. He's sort of again flattened things out. And if you look at the distribution that now Falafel has has got all his stack checkers into play, that he's got no more than three this checkers on a point. You like this play making the seven point rather than running to the thirteen. So that, this is my play, I think. What, six what one, it's a six one, very interesting. Double yeah. two, double two. So again, he oh, he's loose. hitting, of course. Yeah, this is, this course. is falafel style. Yeah. If there's anything to hit, we hit. If there's double deuces, that's a hit. Yeah. Well, then, you know, again, backgammon's a nice, easy game. Make points, hit lots. You know, it's, it's right. simple. So much yeah. is much is having a think here, and he's, he's very clever about these things. Is much he's he's looking at this and considering, well, if I don't get a number here. Do I just routinely get gammoned and lose the match? So how I got to say, yeah, I've got to hit this shot to stay in the match. And I don't think he should double. I, I, I've seen people cube these and uh, sometimes it's right, but most of the times it isn't. Yeah, I, oh, I see, it was Falafel yeah. taking time over the hit and Mochi didn't hesitate at all about rolling. No. <laughs> no. So 5-4, so five, five, that yeah. might look good, but that's actually a poor shot. He wanted to make the five point, which is his number one goal. Okay, double one though, and, not, and of course, you know, Flaffle's never doubling this. Never, ever, ever yeah. doubling this. So this ten, is, that's uh, good, yeah. he needed one, three, eight, or ten. And uh, ten. This, this, I'm afraid, could be it for Mochi. This, this could be is, Sayonara, uh, yeah. Mr. Mochi. Yeah, this, this, this is double four. So that's, four. that's not good. It's no, not, because he's got the guy trapped. stuck. Yep, so he can't come out with fours, five, six, as well, of course, you know. So now his, three, his four, numbers three, are duplicated. Four, Needs one, two, three to come up. Three, six is fine. That's out. Okay, now now he's yeah. winning again. Well, not so much. He wasn't winning the other way. But <laughs> he doesn't he's win in with a three. Oh, yeah. and a, that was a big, 
big throw of the checker there. And I think Falafel will hit that thing loose. Oh, three one. Well, he didn't need to. Yeah. I mean, this is so. This is now looking he's taking it to the very bank. difficult. He's yeah. getting on his mobile phone. He's phoning <laughs> up the back manager. He's saying, "What time do you open Monday morning?" Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and again, safe. If the gammon is done. Yeah. Let's play it safe. There's, there's a rule I know about these positions that there's a a Nor Norwegian girl, Hannah Hannah. Uh, who explained to me her, her simple rule is that you work out your standard gammon winning chances with the two are closed out is 40 mm -hmm. and you add 2% for every pip your opponent needs to get home okay yeah so it's not 100% accurate but you yeah. can do it very quickly so here you can say the three checkers on the midpoint is 21 and the other ones are 27 29 so you multiply that by two, get 58, add the 40 for closing yeah, two out, yeah, you've got 98% I mean, gammons. Right. So, so that tells you how much risk you should be taking. If yes. 50 to 1 on favourite to win the gammon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Falafel uh, might not have any rules, but he can look at the position and say, and, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is <laughs> winning gammons. Yeah, I ain't yeah. giving the guy nothing here. Yeah. <laughs> If yeah, he rolls three double sixes, then good luck to him. Yeah, and this is this is looking very good. So what are we on now? Three, six, twelve, eighteen crossovers, nineteen crossovers to six. That, that looks dead to me. I think it's dead already. Yeah. That's and there's the handshake. Yeah. Hands. Disappointment there for Mochi. I mean, that's that's a big match. So Falafel's now into the final of the Super Jackpot. So that's a sixteen thousand pound prize fund in the final and. Uh, you know, that's that's a big... Now, of course, Falafel wasn't even going to play in the Super Jackpot. Uh -huh, he said, oh, yeah. I might play, I might not yeah. play, I might play. You had and to he, twist uh, his arm. We twisted his arm, yeah. you know, he said, I might come calm, I might, you know. But um, now, and we'll, we'll get the uh, we'll get the error rate from uh, from Aref. Uh, if, if someone could go down and ask what the PRs were, this is what they'll be This is what they'll be determining yeah, now, who yeah. played best, who. Yeah. And I, I bet you Falafel will have offered an error rate bet on this <laughs> with Mochi. In fact, I'm, I'd be surprised if he wasn't offering some bets all the way along, actually, on some of those plays. That's, well, uh, I don't know. I would, I would have thought Moch, Mochi was favourite to be on the error rate. And... Um, it's for Apple's game doesn't doesn't fit in well with the error rates. Uh, because Mochi is a computer player, he plays according to what the computer says, and Falafel is a flair player, he plays according to flair. You know, and the computer doesn't measure flair. <laughs> it doesn't flair understand flair. At the end. It does not understand flair. So we're gonna cut um, we're gonna cut straight through to the Michi Eric McAlpine game, where there's some uh, there's some really interesting stuff happening here. So um, Mishi is about to gammon potentially Eric on a two cube, which will win match. him the match. Yeah. So uh, this is looking um, this is looking very very difficult for Eric. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I can't see Eric. I, well, I, well, he could uh, save this. Yeah, the gammon yeah. is by no means certain no. here. No, indeed. So just he won't come off the ace yet because he can still yeah. play all of the checkers. There was the a, a rule yeah. I got told about this that you. Your favourite to save the gammon if you've got three checkers on the ace point. And that looked like the sort of position we, we started in when we, we came over to this. Yes, yes. So he's got one away safely. Yeah. And this is a 5-1, is it? 5-1, yeah. yeah. So he's, this so, is the play. Yeah, well, do you, are you sure about that play? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely play well, double four. I don't want to waste the three pips, but um, I don't want to... Normally, my, my I mean, I would rule is that very naturally. Normally, my rule is you bring all the other checkers home before you beat you break the anchor. Okay. Because yeah, so okay, you've four. saved three. Pips, I saw five two there. But you miss out yeah. on a lot so of yeah, hitting so chances this is illegal. by breaking the anchor. Yeah, so he's Eric's trying to steal a pip off himself. Not what you want to be doing when trying to save the uh, gammon. This is this is close. Uh, that's I don't a know. This one looks bad. I suppose Mitchie might miss. Five one. So it just needs to save the gammon. I'm not sure about that one. That that is a very good play. Is it? Think. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, again, yeah. Eric's a much better player than me. So. Uh, so Eric needs a bit of luck, and he needs Mitchie to roll a couple. Three of one. Ones. That's a uh, that's a lemon. He's, yeah. So the gonna, best he can get is sixes at the moment, he's unless Mitchie's going to come out here, something isn't he? up. Yeah. yeah. So it must be a three two if he's coming out there. But it's uh, a three one. A uh, three two. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. Sorry, it is a three two. So. But that's why he wanted to get a short crossover because he he wants to be able to get two crossovers in next time and get, yeah, get okay. a big double. So okay. yes, okay, very good. Yeah. Does this make no? This, this is this is this is ridiculous. He's got five crossovers. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah. he'll find this place. Yes, yeah, so this is just level six. Yeah, yeah. Okay, six three. So yeah, so it's the double six. The double it's six, double six, six to better. save it. Five four. Ah, there we go. And there's the handshake. Yep. So, um, so Mishy takes that one. Eric. Uh, Eric yeah, moving um, it in again. Sorry we missed Hero that. That, that would have been a good match, but uh, you say that we've got it recorded. recorded so, yeah. um, so we look forward. Actually, I, I don't know how we we'll have to talk to the uh, to our technical people. But, but with a bit um, of luck, if we have that one recorded. We might be able to show bits of it in between gaps in other games yeah, so and, uh, and an commentate on. Replay. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and uh, and so so get some of the analysis going through. So, what we will try and do is get a um, yeah, is get some of the players up here. See if we have an opportunity to mm, talk to them. Uh, just to autumn. yeah, just to let know what's happening now. Uh, it's seven thirty-five. We've got the um, gala dinner starting at eight o'clock. So pretty much all play will stop during the gala dinner. And what what you probably can't see behind Mishy and Eric. Yeah, is that there will be a, a an army of Hippodrome staff, and the Hippodrome staff are absolutely superb, who will be taking this room apart for dinner, and they'll have been taking it apart around these two games yes. that, we've been, uh, <laughs> that we've been filming. So I think we will uh, we'll, we'll go to a break now. I'm uh, I'm sure we'll have some footage from last year uh, that we've got. We'll try and uh, we'll try and do some more um, footage, but we'll go to a break now and some footage from last year. Um, so that's um, uh, that we can wait the, for the, the technical people are just just all sorting us out. <laughs> now, yeah. So and um, uh, we'll go to the gala dinner. We'll be broadcasting live from the British Backgammon Awards at quarter past nine. So we're looking forward to uh, very much looking forward to those. And tomorrow, what time will coverage be starting tomorrow? We will start at ten o'clock tomorrow morning, London time, um, and we'll start there with again. Um, we've got the uh, professionals tournament concluding. We've got the super jack pot concluding uh, and of course we've got the um, then we've got a number of other cups and trophies as well so uh, just got uh, it's terribly badly paid play Julian those <laughs> those fish so uh, Mochi played at a uh, Two point either four six or nine six. I think that's a nine yeah, actually. It's a two four. point. Uh, it's a four. Yeah. So two Mine point is. four six. Uh, and Falafel paid at two point six six. Yeah, so uh, you know those uh, terrible error rates. Terrible error yeah, rates. Yeah, but so I think the uh, the first one is, is the crucial number, whether it's two forty six or two ninety. Two ninety six. Yeah, that's, that's right. Who, who, would, um, would win who, the bet. who won the bet? That's right. So, um, but so again, we need to get a handwriting expert in to look at that. But I mean, extremely, uh, you know, extremely good. Yes. Play there. Well, I mean that's what we'd expect because there's yes. two two players who are in the top two, top three in the world. Yes. And, uh, well, I mean, I mean that's great to see. Well, on a great uh, exhibition as well, and uh, yeah, I think uh, obviously the score have indicated that Falafel got the best of the dice this time, and yeah, uh, despite my prediction, I'd have gone for Mochi beforehand, but. Uh, yeah. Undoubtedly, but uh, you know, uh, great PRs, great players, and uh, a privilege to be able to watch that. A couple of plays that are worth looking at afterwards, I think. That uh, you remember that three-four by Mochi when yes. he broke the ankle yes, and yes, subsequently yeah, got gammy. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly, especially for me, Falafel's first double three when he didn't make the five point. If you remember then when he played thirteen to seven twice and yes. made the bar instead of the five point. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, uh, one thing again, you see uh, yourself, all the top players do. They will be they will be sitting down and discussing those plays now. They'll be going over through the XG feed. Yep. They'll be going through. They'll be looking at the plays. And you know what will be interesting to them, in many ways, more interesting than the results, will be to go through. And it's that it's that culture of learning, isn't it? Yes, you know, kind of, you know, find that way you, you went might on, have don't make it before, again. Yeah. Before you came in here, when we were talking to the others, was that uh, Zoe was saying that the the top players like Mochi, what they do when they get a match is they look at their errors. That's the first thing. Yes. That yeah. when you look at your errors, you can find out sort of something you're doing wrong that you might be able to avoid in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And so what they don't do, go to the bar, buy a triple whiskey, and tell anyone who will listen to them how yeah. unlucky they got. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not interested in that. What they're interested in is sitting down and learning what they did wrong to see yeah. what they can do to get better. But, uh, yeah. That's that's today because we're still only halfway through the tournament. Yeah. I think tomorrow <laughs> we might have for that all. Going so, down to the bar and buying a few uh, drinks for everyone with his, his, <laughs> with his, with his winnings. Thousand. Let's yeah. hope so. So we're 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 going to draw this to a conclusion. So. Um Julian, thank you. Um, I'm going to go and uh, get changed for the British Backgammon Awards, and uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll be back um, for tomorrow. Uh, we'll be back this evening at 9:15 for the British Backgammon Awards. So uh, thank you all. Tune back in at 9:15 our time. That's in uh, it's in a couple of hours. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. This is this is my tip, is it? That's, That's your tip. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
I'm Zoe Cunningham and I'm here with Mike Main, the Tournament Director at the London Backgammon What is the Tournament Director? Tournament Director, uh, it's my job to make the choice.